Well, tonight, we're going to have a very special event. And also, to avoid uh, boring our regulars, I'm personally going to sort of presume that you have a basic biblical background on Israel. One of the things that we need to understand is that the Bible is a message system of 66 books penned by 40 different guys over thousands of years that are demonstrably an integrated message. And I don't mean just thematically. Every number, every place name is there by design. So this entire package of 66 books penned by 40 guys over thousands of years is an integrated message. And once you discover that, the second discovery is really staggering, and that's to realize the origin of that message is from outside the dimensionality of time. And one of the ways God demonstrates his authorship, see, if he has the technology to create us in the first place, he has the technology to get a message to us. The problem is, how does he authenticate his message? How does he let us know that the message is really from him and not some kind of contrivance or a fraud of some kind? Well, one way he does that is to rely on an attribute that he alone has. He's not somebody that has lots of time. He's someone outside that performs the physical dimension of time itself. And he knows history before it happens, and he writes history in advance. So if you want, you say you can't prove the Bible wrong, you can. And the way you do it is by demonstrating the dozens of places that the Bible writes history before it happens. But if you want to know what time it is on God's calendar, all you have to do is look at Israel. Quite apart from your attitudes or, or whatever you, about Israel literally and so forth, it is God's time clock. Its origin, its ups, its downs, its entire history was written, at event, it, written in advance. And it's one of ten different strategic trends we monitor on our website. I think most of you in this audience are familiar with that. If you're not, I encourage you to take a look at our website. K House, no one can pronounce Koinonia House. Koinonia is the Greek word for communication or fellowship. Our ministry is called Koinonia House, but no one can pronounce it, let alone spell it. Everyone calls us K House. So our website is khouse.org. And on that website, you will find us explain, give backgrounds, and monitor day to day, week to week, those 10, ten strategic trends. One of, the, one of them, in fact, the key one, is Israel. And if you want to know where we are in God's plan, Israel's always where you look. And once you understand that, you'll begin to realize that we are on the threshold of the climax of all human history. One of the statements that I'm fond of making when we're speaking to a large audience, especially one that uh, may be new to us, I usually put a preposterous statement on the screen. And if you accept the statement, I'm about, um, the statement I'm about to make is one I believe, but that's irrelevant. If you accept the statement I'm about to make, you flunk the course. Because what I want you to do is challenge critically the statement I'm about to make. The statement I'm going to make is that you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. Now that's a preposterous statement. I'm suggesting that the time we're moving into is a time about which the Bible says more than it does even about the gospel period. You say, Chuck, that's pretty absurd. I hope you, I hope you feel that way because I want you to challenge that. To do that, you've got to do two things. The first thing you've got to do is find out what the Bible really says. Most Christians are tragically illiterate biblically illiterate. Many pastors even don't really know their Bible as they should. Find out what the Bible really says. The second thing used to be hard, it's not hard today. You've got to find out what's going on. And you won't on the 10 o'clock news. Because most of you are sophisticated enough to understand we live with managed media. Media that takes pride in shaping opinions rather than informing people which is a prostitution of their mandate because a free press is supposed to uh, educate the inform the electorate. But we have a, a power group that controls the media that has its own agenda and is proud of it, is unabashedly pushing an agenda rather than trying to inform us. But the good news is there is 
an institution called the alternative press, the proprietary newsletters, the talk show hosts, the internet has put an end run on the managed media for those that are diligent, and God always rewards the diligent. Now, there's a lot of stuff on the internet that's nonsense, but there's also, you can find out anything you want to if you know where to look on the internet. So you want to get sophisticated, and if you don't understand it, ask your kids. They'll explain it to you. <laughs> so. Now, many of you in this audience are used to having me go on and prattle about the origin and the commitments that the God of the universe has made to this peculiar people called Israel, a peculiar covenant relationship he has with them. What many of you may not realize is every benefit that you and I have in Jesus Christ, we derive strangely from the, from the covenant with Abraham. Very bizarre. You see, whether you realize it or not, we worship from a Jewish Bible in a church that was founded by Jewish leadership and so on. And uh, so even as Gentiles, we owe a debt to the Jewish people, collectively and individually in many ways. But if we want to know what's going on in God's program, we need to understand Israel, not just because of our love for Israel and, and all those considerations, but just as a pragmatic to know what's coming. Now, this gets particularly dramatic because the next 12 to 18 months are obviously going to be more turbulent than any of us probably have a willingness to face. I just got back a little over a month ago from being treated to a, as an a, a invited civilian participant to the National Security Forum at the Air War College at Maxwell Air Force Base. And we were briefed by the CIA, the DIA, and so on and so forth. I'm not at liberty to discuss in detail what we found out, but I can tell you I've never come away. I spent a good part of my life, as most of you know, in the strategic community not only in the Air Force, but also in the intelligence community, and then as chairman of the board and CEO of four different publicly traded defense contractors. So I have at least a perspective uh, to, that, yield, that uh, contributes to my prejudices and opinions. And I can tell you I've never been more stunned and more proud and more comfortable of our military, on the one hand. But I also believe that there isn't anyone that I've met in that establishment that has any real idea of what's likely to happen over the next six to 12 months. Now, one of the things most of you in this audience are subscribers not only to our website, and by the way, if you not only do we monitor 10, 10 strategic trends, we also will give you free of charge a once a week, one page summary of what happened this week that's biblically relevant. It generally consists of four or five items, just a paragraph long, and it lists the website that is competently following that particular event, whatever it might be, whether it's a trend in the federal courts or whether it's the rise of Europe or whether it's the Middle East or whatever. And we will send you that one-week summary. We call it e-news. It's a weekly little paper. It's free. We'll do it until you tell us to turn it off. Just give us your web, give us your, when you log on our website, it gives you a chance to give us your email address, and we'll send you that every week until you say enough already, enough already. Um, of course, we publish our monthly newsletter, those of you that are, most of you are familiar with. Um, one of the things, of course, that uh, we're here to do is to try to bring you up to date on what's forthcoming. One of the questions that I get asked as I travel, Chuck, where on earth do you get your information? Because you know that from time to time we've scooped the general news, whether it was the murder of Ron Brown, whether it was the murder of Vince Foster, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I usually quip with my tongue in my cheek, I just make it up. <laughs> but there is a ground rule in journal, and by the way, we also are privy to a lot of classified stuff that I can't use. See, I, the, my friends in the, in the E-ring of the Pentagon have learned that unless they give me a public document with some notes in the margin, I can't use what they give me because it's a, viol it's, it's a violation of security. When they send me a published article and highlight a few things so I can connect the dots, I can use that. 
But one of the ground rules in journalism is that you don't disclose your sources. But I'm going to violate that tonight. Because in July of 2001, we had a speaker here on this platform that happened in the course of things to predict the World Trade Center debacle that happened a few months later. He was here in July, and on September 9th, I think you've noticed, some things happened in New York and in Washington. And that, of course, needless to say, put him on the map. A lot of people were followers of him before, but that, of course, propelled him into the worldwide limelight. And I'm, I'm speaking, of course, of a dear friend, a friend that I regard as a member of the family. He's a very, very close personal friend. And uh, rather than prattle along stuff that you've heard me say before, or you can easily find out from one or uh, other tapes that we can accompany this with if you happen to be listening to tape, that's fine. But I want to give as much time as we can to my dear friend, Avi Lipkin. Avi? Did you... Will you stand, please? Oh. I, want, I want him to tell his wife that he got a standing ovation. So. <laughs> but before we start, I start kidding him. Let's bow our hearts with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you that in your kingdom there are no accidents, no coincidences, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. And Father, we simply ask that you and your sovereignty, with all your resources, would just see to it that your purpose is accomplished in each of our lives as we just commit this evening and ourselves into your hands as we come before you in the name of, Avram, of the God of Avram, Itzhak, and Yaakov, and Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much. Now, one of the questions that you all want to ask him, I've been around enough to know that everybody asks him, were you really ever a member of the Mossad? And you need to understand that anybody that was has an oath to lie, you see. So he will deny it. That doesn't mean he was in the Mossad, but it means if he was, he would deny that he was. So I just thought I'd help you with that, you see. You got it, buddy. Thank you very much. And if my uh, radio and TV booking agent gets me onto Hannity and Combs and they ask me, were you on the most side, I'll say, well, of course I deny it. <laughs> but seriously, I was not in the Mossad, and yet the Saudis gave me a lot of credit in their article. Now, you don't read Arabic. I have the English translation on the table, and it's free. Just come to the table. We'll give you a copy of the English translation. And I kind of wanted to start with this just as a footnote. And the reason I'm starting with this as a footnote is because there is a movement afoot to stifle freedom of speech and freedom of religion. And this movement is an Islamic movement. And it's not maybe so much here in America, because you do not yet have the Holocaust law in the United States. You have it in Canada, you have it in Australia, you have it in Switzerland, and I was just in Switzerland. That's why the Saudis put me on the first page of their newspaper. You know the uh, actor Rodney Dangerfield? He says, I don't get no respect. Well, now the Saudis gave me a lot of respect. So now you have to give me a lot of prayer. <laughs> but, uh, of course, you know, we all believe, we all know to whom is the victory. And my message tonight is not intended to be a depressing message. It'll be maybe an alarming message, but it is going to be, in the end, good news. What Islam is trying to do is to stifle any criticism of Islam. I call it not criticism, I call it the truth. And it's borne out in the Bible and it's borne out by current events. And so you have to be very vigilant here in America to make sure that Congress will never ever adopt the same law that Canada and Australia and certain countries in Europe have adopted called the hatred laws. 
The hatred law says you cannot preach against any other religion. This is a very dangerous thing because what happens is then anyone who preaches the gospel is going to go to jail. And that's what happened just now in Australia. And it happened in Canada. I know the man who was convicted, a missionary, a preacher, convicted of the hatred laws because he was preaching the gospel. What was he saying? He was saying if Muslim children can, can pray in Canadian schools in Mississauga, which is just outside of Toronto, but it, it's not fair then that Christian and Jewish kids cannot pray. So that he was convicted of the hatred laws. See, Islam can get away with anything in this country, and of course, Judeo-Christianity cannot. In my second book, I have a quote which I received actually from a group called Women Aglow. They sent me an article from July 4th, 1998, from a, a Hayward, California newspaper, The Daily Review. And the quote that I quote is uh, an interview with Omar Ahmad, who is, is, was the head of the Council on American Islamic Relations. And he says, Islam is not in America merely to be equal to any other religion, but to become the dominant religion. The Quran, which is the book of Islam, must be the supreme scripture in America, and Islam, the only accepted religion on earth. This is in America. In other words, the plans are afoot in America. And it could be, unfortunately, that the Ten Commandments were taken out of that Alabama courthouse, and the Christians did not protest. When I say Christians did not protest, you should have had 10, 20, 30 million people protesting in the streets. So the Bible is not allowed to be taught in schools, but the Quran is forced reading. Three-week courses in seventh grade social studies classes that American kids must learn about Islam. They must learn about jihad. They must learn how to recite the shihada. The shihada, basically, if you say it, you've become a Muslim. They're making American kids convert to Islam in American schools. It's a very cleverly designed plot. By whom? By your friends, the Saudis. And you cannot build a church in Saudi Arabia. And you cannot pray openly as Christians. And I, as a Jew, am not allowed by law to step on Saudi soil. That's how much they hate the Jews. Anyway, so thank you very much to the Saudis. And I'm very appreciative of the Saudis because uh, this has given me the wherewithal to go public in Israel, to do my books in Hebrew and uh, start preparations for a Judeo-Christian political party in Israel, which I hope will run in the next official elections in 2007. So this is something we'll talk about at the very end of the message. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to start with the end of the message, and then we're gonna, it'll be, from there it'll all be flashbacks. What I'm going to do in the first session is to talk about the five deceptions of Islam. A lot of Americans don't have a clue about 9-11. A lot of Americans, even today, are under the deception that Islam is a religion of love, Islam is a religion of peace, we all serve the same God, that Jesus Christ of Islam is the same Jesus Christ of Christianity, and that the Quran is the divine infallible word of Allah to Muhammad. These are the five deceptions of Islam. And I'm going to be spending the first hour basically on this message. In the second hour, we're going to talk about the missile threat to Israel. And this is what I think we have to focus on in the second hour. And then for those of you who are not tired of sitting for two hours, I mean, I won't be offended if you leave. I, I'm not here to talk less, I'm here to talk more. And I was told technically we have three hours of tape, and so I am available for questions and answers. <laughs> and I talk till you drop. The subject is a very weighty subject. It's not a very pleasant subject, and so I try to pepper the message with some funny points and jokes. And I wanted to start out with one of the proofs, I believe, of God's existence. I'm driving across the United States in April, a year and a half ago. I arrived with Alal in New York. I picked up my car there at my father's house. My father's 89, by the way. Praise God. He does my accounting, he goes to the bank, he has a 69-year-old girlfriend. <laughs> you ever watch Rockford Files? 
My father's Rocky. <laughs> and uh, so I get the car and I start driving cross country to California. And I leave on Monday and I'm supposed to arrive in Oakland, California on Friday to speak before the Judeo-Christian Zionist Conference in Oakland with Rosemary Schindler. I don't know if any of you have heard of her. And a very special Christian woman. And um, I had a few detours. I got held up. I had to do a TV show in Odessa, Midland, Texas with Pram Tam. <laughs> Pram Tam, Christian TV in Odessa. And then I had to go to Skip Heitzig's church in Albuquerque. And to make a long story short, the sun is setting Friday afternoon. The Sabbath is rapidly approaching. And there is no way I'm going to make it to Oakland. And I'm driving two hours, three hours, four hours on Highway 40, heading towards Barstow. And you know there's nothing there for two, three, four hours. And the sun is about two fingers above the horizon, which means the Sabbath is there almost. And I called the rabbi in Oakland, the Chabad rabbi, who, was also going to, who also spoke at the Judeo-Christian conference. And I apologized, and I said to him, you know, rabbi, I'm not going to make it. Uh, I'm going to stop in Barstow for the Sabbath. He said, by all means. He told me where the synagogue was. I went to the synagogue. I uh, prayed with the Jews the Friday night service, and then after, we, after that we had dinner, and then they said, well, that, across the street is the Ramada Inn, and you know in Barstow, for those of you who have been there, you have all these motels, and they said they're all re re really rather sleazy places, and that the Ramada Inn is the only really respectable place in town. So I went across the street uh, ch to check in, and as I'm uh, entering the hotel, this very beautiful, elegant black lady standing there, very tall, very pretty, and um, she curtsies. She says, welcome to Barstow. How are you today? And uh, I was in a mean mood after driving five days across the United States <laughs> and having to stop in the middle of the De Mojave Desert instead of making it to the rabbi's house and have a nice kosher Shabbat meal. And I said to her, I'm very tired. I've just driven across the United States of America, and uh, I think I'll feel a lot better after I've checked in, taken a shower, and gone to sleep. And um, so I go to the reception, and this black lady goes to the reception also. I thought she was a, a hostess or official receptionist uh, from the hotel. And the receptionist comes out and says, uh, what can I do for you two? <laughs> and uh, I had to think fast. I said, Lord, give me the words. And then all of a sudden it came to me. This lady was here first, ladies first. And so this black lady says, my pastor wants a bottle of bottled water. Where is the dispenser? And so she was told where to get the water for her pastor. I said, tell me, what's going on? She said, well, our church is celebrating its 25th anniversary here at this Ramada Inn. And uh, my pastor sent me to get a bottle of water. I said, tell me, what church do you go to? So she said, oh, it doesn't really matter. I just go to some non-denominational charismatic church. So I said to her, well, I'm a Jew from Israel, and I preach in Christian churches, and non-denominational charismatic are my favorite churches. <laughs> and all of a sudden, her eyes go like this. She says, I know you. I know that voice. Yesterday, Thursday, I received your tape, The Legacy of Hate. And I listened to it three times. And your wife's name is Rachel, and she's from Egypt. And she taught you everything you know about Islam. <laughs> and yes, you said you just drove across the United States. I know who you are. Your name, your name is Avi Missler. <laughs> and you know, that proves to me God's existence. Because nobody knew that I was stopping in Barstow, California, in the middle of the desert, unscheduled stop. And God was speaking to me through that black woman to say to me, I know where you are at every given moment, and I'm always with you. And, uh, you know, many times you need a little nudge from God to confirm that he's with you. And so that's one of my, one of my uh, Chuck Missler testimonies. <laughs> and you don't want to meet, hear my Hal Lindsey testimony because I have a Chuck Missler Hal Lindsey testimony too. I want you to tell about your healing. Okay, well... You got that on tape yesterday. Okay, now listen, I hope there are no Baptists here who will be offended <laughs> by my, by my pro-charismatic uh, Pentecostal approach. I'm a Jew who loves every Christian, whether it be Baptist or one who speaks in tongues. And don't be angry with me. I even love the Catholics. I love everybody. 
Only a Jew can. And uh, I even love the Messianics. Everybody hates the Messianics. Anyway, <laughs> I have to tell you, I do a lot of traveling, and it's not an easy life. I've been uh, on the road for the last 10 years, eight months out of every year. And uh, so you get all kinds of uh, things that, uh, as you get older, uh, you know, older people will understand what I'm saying. You know, it's like uh, you're like in a, an airplane, and sometimes you get into bumpy weather, and then it straightens out, and then again, again, bumpy weather, and straightens out. And if God wants you to live a long life, so every few years you come into some kind of uh, health uh, question, and, and the question is, how do you deal with the health question? And, uh, for example, once uh, I was... Um, in a men's warehouse, and uh, my shoes were really old, and they said, oh, we have this wonderful pair of shoes for you, and they gave me a very nice pair of loafers, and uh, I liked them so much, I was wearing them really for two years, and they just never wore out. And it's kind of like in, in the desert, 40 years, you know, the shoes didn't wear out, and I was waiting for them to wear out, because I wanted to get new shoes, but they just didn't wear out, and, they, and I have flat feet, and these were not with arches, and I never really thought about it, and by the end of a year and a half, I was starting to limp and I couldn't go up the stairs. And basically, I had to drag myself up and down stairs, and I was limping all the time, very simply because I, had, I needed arches. Anyway, so I'm limping in the churches, and, and all of a sudden, Christians are getting on their hands and knees and holding onto my shoes and holding onto my feet and speaking in tongues and praying for me not to limp anymore. And to make a long story short, my wife bears me, buys me these Nike sneakers, which are you know, good for dress shoes, but also for, with arches. And after six months, the limping went away. So, I mean, this, is just, this, is a little, this doesn't count as a testimony, but I get to the next testimony. Uh, I have something called Barrett syndrome. Barrett syndrome, for those of you who don't know, is, is one of the forms of acid reflux. And my mother actually died from this. It can cause cancer. You know, when the, you get the reflux in the, in the esophagus, it, if it's untreated, it becomes cancerous. And my brother had a very serious operation to correct that. And I had a date for that operation. And I'm in the churches, and uh, the Christians say, what's the matter with you? I said, well, I've got this acid reflux. I've got this uh, Barrett syndrome. And, you know, these, these crazy Christians say, in the name of Jesus, we take authority over Satan. And don't say Barrett syndrome, because when you say Barrett syndrome, you're conceding to Satan. <laughs> and all of a sudden, 20 people come over, lay their hands on me, and start speaking in tongues. And people are crying and screaming and falling to the ground, glued to the floor. <laughs> and I was taking Prilosec also, you know, so I... Little by little, I stopped taking the Prilosec. I didn't take, do the operation, and it went away. And praise God, I go to sleep every night now. I don't have the acid reflux. And I'm telling you, something that genetically my family, on my mother's side, suffered for many years. So, okay, so two things. You know, you don't really pay attention to this. Then last February, the doctor says to me in Israel, you know, your sugar is off the charts. You've got diabetes. So you've got to take insulin, and you've got to take this, and you've got to take that. And I bought this little machine to prick my finger and check my blood every day. And it was 460, 470. No matter what I did, 460, 470. Come to the States, and this Christian woman looks at me. What's the matter with you? I said, oh, nothing. I just have diabetes. In the name of Jesus, don't say diabetes because then you're giving it to Satan. And we take authority over Satan. Twenty people come running over, lay their hands on me, speaking in tongues and passing out and glued to the floor. And... Never took insulin, never took any medication. I prick my finger every morning, 82, 92, sometimes 109. So praise God, you know, I'm still eating coconut cream pie, don't tell my wife. <laughs> and pass, you know, pa praise the Lord, pass the ammunition. So anyway, I, so I'm very, very pleased, you know, that uh, God is uh, taking good care of me. And I really, at this moment, cannot think of anything that's bothering me. So God has a reason to... Straighten me out each time. Anyway, I, I'm here to talk about other things, but I could, I could spend the next three hours telling jokes in the Lord, you know. <laughs> you know, I'll just tell you one joke, and then I'll get into the message. You know the joke about the Baptist pastor and the Pentecostal pastor? The Baptist pastor had a dog, and he tried to train the dog, and the dog was really impossible. And, but he had to get the dog trained. And then he heard that there was this Pentecostal pastor in town who was really good with dogs. But, you know, Baptist pastors don't like Pentecostal pastors. But finally, he decided, this is it. I've got to get the dog trained. So he goes to the Pentecostal pastor and says, can you train my dog? He says, sure, three weeks. Come back in three weeks. Three weeks later, he comes back, says, is my dog trained? He says, oh, you have a wonderful, well-disciplined dog. Well, let's see what he can do. So they say, sit. So the dog sits. You know, roll over. The dog rolls over. And then when they said heel, he raised his paw. Woof, woof, woof. <laughs>
Okay, now we roll up our sleeves and get to work. And I, if, you, if, if you don't start squirming and get up and leave in the middle, I might tell one or two more jokes because they are part of the message, actually. And uh, by the way, I want to say in all seriousness, I have out on the table three books which are about 13, 14 hours of reading. And uh, even if we do two or even three hours tonight, it's only maximum one-third of the message. I also have nine hours of video. I only have a few sets on the table. The reason I made my nine-hour video teaching was if, I, God forbid, something happens to me, or let's say, praise God, something happens to me, that I end up having to be in Jerusalem uh, forming this Judeo-Christian political party to run for the Knesset. Well, if I'm Jerusalem in the Knesset, then I will not be preaching in you know, Koinonia House or in churches you know, around the United States and spending eight months of the year driving around the United States. So the nine-hour video is a discipleship video, and the books are discipleship books. And what I need is for those of you who uh, want to be disciples, you know, it's not enough just to have faith. You know, faith without works is dead. You've heard that before. And so you have to have the faith, but you also have to have the training, and that's why Koinonia House is such a, a, key, uh, a keystone for what I'm doing, what I've been doing. And indeed, uh, uh, Chuck is very, very right that... Uh, I basically got on the map because of 9-11 and because of the things that I had been saying pre-9-11. Uh, and by the way, you know, some Christians say I'm a prophet. I say I'm not a prophet uh, unless Paul Revere was a prophet. You know, I'm just spreading an alarm and a warning that things are about to happen because we know that they're happening. Uh, those who have eyes to see and ears, ears to hear will know this. But it could be that my wife is a prophet. I'm just the shofar. Once I got court-martialed in the Israeli army for saying that Is Egypt was about to attack Israel, and uh, it said, Israeli intelligence officer Avi Lipkin. I was never in the Israeli intelligence. I don't know where to get this intelligence thing. Actually, the Christian embassy said it, you know, in Jerusalem. And then when I was court-martialed, I said, well, where did you get this information that Egypt is going to attack? I said, well, I got it from my wife. And because my wife monitors the Arabic radio broadcasts of our neighbors, including Egypt. So when my wife said, so what happened? What happened? I said, I got court-martialed. I said, because I said, because I said Egypt was going to attack. He said, well, where did you get that from? I said, well, I got it from you. And she says, well, so why do you listen to me? <laughs> so you can't win with these women. <laughs> and uh, we will be talking about Egypt uh, tonight also, because Egypt has been very neglected. That will be in the second hour. Okay, what I want to do indeed, uh, it may seem strange uh, to, to have like a Bible teaching for the first hour, but the, the purpose of the Bible teaching in the first hour is to show you that you might not necessarily believe in God, but you have to understand that the people who are coming up against America today are people who are religious people, and their religion is teaching them to do this war against Jews and Christians and against Hindus and Buddhists and even against fellow Muslims. And so the nature of the enemy is a religious nature. The nature of their God is a religious nature. So you have to understand the religious framework in which this war is taking place. And I always say that I will be willing and, and glad to meet with atheists, apostates, and New Agers because the Muslims will kill them too. Muslims, the Islamic religion is an equal opportunity destroyer. <laughs> they don't, the Islamic bombs and the suicide bombers don't ask you what church, synagogue, or mosque you belong to. Or are you atheist, apostate, or new ager? And the threat of Islam is a, is a threat which, is, uh, if it succeeds, God forbid, will destroy the world. Now what I want to do is... Um, watching the clock, and again, keep, I'm going to keep this very short because this first hour that we're doing, I do in three hours normally. And the second hour, I do in six hours. So we're going to be distilling, and I'm going to speak very quickly. And if I speak quickly, then when you go home with the tape, you can just put it on half speed or third speed. And <laughs> I want you to know I'm a, 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 a person who's doing penitence. I'm guilty of two very major sins. One is the sin of uh, hatred, and the other is the sin of ignorance. And you have to understand the penitence as an answer to the two sins in order to understand how I understand the Islamic way of thinking and why I'm coming here to warn you. And first I want to say that you know, when you have something 
and you don't appreciate it, then when you lose it, that's when you appreciate it. I was born in the United States of America, and uh, I, I never hated this country. I love this country. I moved to Israel at age 19 um, for Zionist reasons, but also because I felt that the Christians hated me. And um, living in the Middle East 35 years, let me tell you, has made me a bigger lover and appreciator of America than I ever was in the first 19 years of my life. When you lose America, that's when you appreciate America. And living in the Middle East 35 years, I can see just how close you are to losing America. Um, and I'm going to be getting back to the uh, anointing that God has placed on America. Um, but first, I, have to, I want to explain a little bit about myself. This will take five, ten minutes, and then we will get into the five deceptions. And then probably in the second hour, we'll talk about the role, as I see it, of the United States of America in saving the world from itself. Like I said before, I used to hate Christians. By the way, I never hated the Muslims. And I don't hate the Muslims now. And this business of the Saudis, that they're suing this Christian gentleman, Werner Scherer, who brought me to Switzerland to speak, because we broke together the racism and hatred laws, this is outright ridiculous. Because I love the Muslims. They're human beings created in the image of God. What I hate is a Nazi-like system which calls for the destruction of my people, the Jews. But Islam calls not only for my destruction, it calls for the destruction of the Christians, the Hindus, the Buddhists, and even fellow Muslims. Islam is a satanic, warlike, destructive system. My family came from Russia, from Poland, over 100 years ago. They fled from the persecution of the Tsars to go to Argentina. Argentina uh, was, is uh, primarily a Roman Catholic country. My parents grew up in totally Catholic Christian uh, uh, neighbors. There were no Jews in the area. They, didn't know, they knew that they were Jews, but that's all they knew. My parents never learned Hebrew. They never went to synagogue. And their lives were totally Argentine, just like their fellow Catholic neighbors. When they came to America, my parents decided, that because I was uh, so ignorant, of, uh, of, they were ignorant of Judaism, that they wanted me to go to Hebrew school. So I went to Hebrew school. I was born in 49, so in 1955 I started going to Hebrew school at age 6. 1955 was only 10 years after the end of World War II. Therefore, it is understandable that the emphasis in Hebrew school would be the Holocaust. And you all know that the Jewish people today focus very much on the Holocaust museums and on the Holocaust traditions, and it was a terrible thing. We lost a third of our people. And I don't know if, if I was right or I was wrong, but uh, my conclusions were that I had to hate the German people. And then we were taught about the persecutions in Russia, the Tsarist persecutions and then the communist persecutions. So I hated the Russians. It was also at the height of the Cold War. We were taught about the Catholic Inquisition. So I hated Spain, Portugal, France, and Italy. <laughs> and you know what? Even the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, you know, the wasps of America, never killed the Jews. Jews were only blessed in America. But what we, were, what we used to say in Hebrew school, what we were taught and what we used to say was, rest assured that they will come, that the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants of America will also kill us. Because Jews always live 100, 200, 300, 400 years maximum, then they get slaughtered. And so I said to myself, you know what, better just to pick up and leave. And I moved to Israel at age 19. I went, again, there was a, a Zionist pull, prophetic, a biblical pull to go home, because it says the Jews will go home. And then there was this misconceived notion of anti-Semitism pushing me out of the United States. And so I moved to Israel at age 19. I meet my wife January 14, 1970, and uh, the very first thing my wife says to me when we start you know, talking seriously, the first thing she says, which is what she always starts our conversations with, she says, are you crazy? <laughs> my wife always starts the conversation, are you crazy? And she always ends the conversation, you don't know anything. <laughs> and that's the way it's been for 35 years. And my wife says to me, why did you leave America? And I said to her, because the goyim hate us. How many people here know what the word goyim is? Okay, now goyim is the Hebrew word, which is plural of the word goy. Goy means a nation. The children of Israel at Mount Sinai differentiated themselves from the rest of the world 3,500 years ago by accepting the Torah, 
Therefore, we became Goy Kadosh. We became a holy nation. The Goyim, the nations, are the heathens, the pagans, those who were not part of Israel. So I said to my wife, you know, the Jews in America say that the Christians are the Goyim. Now, by the way, how many people here, you know, I go to church. I go to church five days a week. Friday, Saturday, I go to synagogue. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, and I go into churches, and pastors get up and say, we Gentiles must bless the Jews. How many people here feel that you're Gentiles? I see some hands there, some hands there. Okay, now, put your hand down your hands. Never raise your hands again when I ask that question. <laughs> My wife says to me, you don't know anything. See, in Egypt and in the Islamic lands, there are three groups. You have the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims. The Jews and the Christians are called in Arabic, Ahel el Kitab. Ahel el Kitab. Kitab is the Bible, and Ahel is the people, not the peoples. The Jews and the Christians are the people, singular, of the book. We have the same God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have the same Bible. And we all agree that the Messiah is a Jew who speaks Hebrew. So for the Christians, that's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The Jews don't know yet who the Messiah is. But for the Christians, he's a Jew who speaks Hebrew. For the Christians, he's a Jew who speaks Hebrew. The, the Muslims, they are the Gentiles. The Muslims, they are the Goyim. Because they have another God, Allah, who is not the same God as the Jews and the Christians. They have another book called the Quran. And the Quran is a replacement theology book. The Quran replaces the Bible of the Jews and the Christians. And thirdly, the Messiah is a Muslim. In other words, Jesus comes back a second time as a Muslim to kill all the Jews and the Christians, to kill those of the Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book. So the Muslims, they are the Gentiles. They are the Goyim. Christians cannot be Gentiles. So I hope I've taught you something that you might not have thought of before. And I'll tell you, I always listen to my wife, but it takes me sometimes 20 or 30 years before it sinks in. <laughs> and this teaching about the Christians and the Jews being one people, I heard it, but I didn't understand it. That was in 1970. And it wasn't until 1986, 1987, I was 37, 38 years old, still hated the Christians. And you have to remember, even my mother and father said to me, you know, they never taught me to hate Christians, but they said, you know, historically, when the Catholic Church was persecuting the Jews, it was the Islamic countries that took in the Jews. And I'll tell you something which is kind of funny. In 1966, this was before the 67 war, I was a freshman at New York University in Manhattan, in New York City. And I used to go to the meetings of the Arab Student Organization. And they received me nicely, and I liked them very much, and they liked me. And one day, I got angry with them. This was in 1966. You know, we were still in the borders of 1948. And I said to them, what's the matter with you Muslims? I said to them, why did you let Ferdinand and Isabella defeat us in 1492? We had the golden age. The Jews, the Christians, and the, and the Muslims together had the golden age in Spain. It was terminated by the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella in 1492. Why did you let these barbarians defeat you? And they looked at me, and they really didn't have an answer for me. So I just want you to know, I, I did not hate the Muslims then, and I don't hate the Muslims today. And I'll explain to you also why I don't hate the Muslims. I'll get to that as we go along. 1986... An article appears in the Jerusalem Post, an ad, looking for English-speaking Israelis to correspond with American Zionist Christians. Now, I heard American Zionist Christians, and that sounded to me like an oxymoron. <laughs> How can a Christian be a Zionist? And I said, I have to check it out. And I start writing to this Nancy in Texas, and she writes me these nauseatingly sweet letters that only Christians can write to Jews. And let me tell you, the scales began to fly hard and fast from my eyes. See, I used to say all Christians were bad people. That's why I left America, to be in Israel, to be away from the Christians. And she writes me a letter, you Jews, you're all wonderful people. You Jews, you're all good people. And I almost wanted to throw up. 
because living in Israel, I know that there are good Jews and there are bad Jews. And I said to her, there are good Jews and there are bad Jews, just like there are good Jew Christians and there are bad Christians. That was scale number one that came off my eyes. God has a sense of humor. What can I say? Then she writes me another letter, please forgive me for the Holocaust. I said to her, you yellow rose of Texas, I said to her. <laughs> you were born in 51, after the Holocaust. You were born in the hill country of Texas. You ne we were never in Europe. You were never outside of Texas. You were never outside of the hill country. There's nothing to forgive. You're innocent. But one of the lessons I learned from that was that Christians, by their true nature as Christians, are innocent, but they bear the guilt of the world on their shoulders because that's what Jesus did. So that was scale number two. Then I went to... I don't want to talk about it, but I, I, I have a little sidebar here. I don't know how many of you have been watching Fox News in the last two or three days, but there was a scandal in Israel about the government press office. How many people have been following this? There was a scandal in the government press office that uh, they made these new rules, and uh, every journalist has to be checked out by the Israeli Secret Service, and then they have to pay very high fees. And Anyway, to make a long story short, I worked as a translator in 8990 uh, in, the, in this prime minister's uh, government press office, and I was given... Um, a tender to participate in, and I won the tender. And then when I demanded tenure by law after six months, uh, they fired me. Why? Because they knew my political views, which were right-wing, and the Israeli civil service is controlled by the Labor Party. And everything there is done by personal connections. The guy who fired me became, eventually, the head of the government press office. It was just revealed this week that he was made government head of the government press office illegally. He had not fulfilled the conditions of the tender, which I did fulfill. And so now he's just been fired. So anyway, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> but it was kind of a vindication. But anyway, so this Yellow Rose of Texas says to me, you all come to Texas, and I'll open up the churches and synagogues and radio and TV. And she kept her word. And so in November of 1990, I go to her church in New Braunfels, Texas. I was 41 years old. I had never in my life attended a Christian church of any kind. And here I am in this church, white people, black people, Hispanics, Native Americans, all holding hands, all loving God, a preacher preaching for Israel, loving Israel, and all of a sudden, the next scale comes off my eyes that not only was Nancy crazy, but the whole church was crazy. <laughs> and people were speaking in tongues, and people were falling to the ground. I mean, this is a shock for a Jew when he goes for the first time to a Christian church. But they were loving Israel, and they were crying tears for Israel. And so I realized that that whole church of 400 people, that they loved Israel. And this was a shock. And I get into a lot of trouble with my fellow Jews because I say, fellow Jews, you have to go to church on Sunday. They say, oh, a Jew for Jesus. And I say, no, I'm not a Jew for Jesus. But when you go to church, you can feel the love that the Christians have for us. And indeed, many times when I'm in my home synagogue in New York where I grew up, they say, where are you going now? I say, I'm going to Texas or Idaho or California or wherever. They say, why are you going there? They hate us. I say, you have to go to church. If you go to a Christian church, you'll see how the Christians love the Jews. And secondly, you'll learn the Bible from, an, from another perspective, which is equally valid. So they say, ah, we don't go to synagogue on Saturday. Why should we go to the church on Sunday? <laughs> so I'm in this church, and you, there were white people, black people, Native Americans, and Tex-Mex Hispanics. But the whites were blonde, blue-eyed people. They looked like Germans. And, you know, in, in San Antonio area, you have a lot of bases. All these people were crew cuts. They look like Nazi soldiers from the 1930s. <laughs> but they were crying tears for Israel. See, I hated the Germans. And I, but I, saw the, I, I could see their love. I said, you know what? These are American Germans. They came 150 years ago. It's okay. They're kosher. <laughs> 1996, in Jan I'm talking, I mean, this is just a few years ago. 1996. The Christian Embassy invites me to screen the Jihad in America. How many people have seen the PBS video, Jihad in America, by Stephen Emerson? I have maybe six, seven copies on the table. This was made in 1994, after the first attack on the World Trade Center in 1993. And the bottom lines of this movie were, firstly, that Islam wants to establish an international empire and destroy the United States. And secondly, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. In other words, if they didn't succeed in destroying the World Trade Center in 93 that they would try again. And they did, and they did succeed. The movie uh, had quotes like, 
Faiz Azam, one of the Islamic leaders in Atlanta in 1991, says the religion of Allah requires scalps. There must be widows. There must be orphans. There must be blood. Arms and limbs must be cut, and blood and limbs must be spread everywhere so that the religion of Allah will stand on its feet. Another quote, for example, was uh, Sheikh Abdulaziz Ude, December 30th, 1990, just before Desert Storm. He says, and now Allah is bringing back the Jews in large groups from all over the world to Palestine to their mass graveyard where the promise will be kept and destiny will be realized upon the Jews. So this was a second quote. And then they were talking about blowing up airplanes and blowing up the World Trade Center. And this movie was made with the help of the FBI, the CIA, and the State Department. You all heard of Paul Bremer in Iraq? He stars in this movie. He's not anti-Muslim. And the movie was buried for being anti-Muslim. It wasn't anti-Muslim, it was anti-terrorism. And Stephen Emerson got blacklisted everywhere. He got a death sentence. And I've been selling thousands of these tapes in the last uh, 10 years. So I screened this in front of the Christian embassy in Jerusalem. And two gentlemen come up to me looking very European, you know, with a beret and a scarf and a sweater underneath their jacket. I mean, it's very European. And they say to me, would you like to come and speak in our stats? And I said to myself, there's no way I'm going to Germany. No way. And I said, where is your seminary? You know, they had a, a seminary for pastors. And I said, they said, in Basel, in Switzerland. I said, well, they were neutral in World War II. That's kosher. I'm going. I'm speaking in the same hall where Theodore Herzl spoke 100 years before in 1897, where he predicted that within 50 years there would be a Jewish state. I'm speaking before 5,000 people. And I could see the tears in their eyes. And also the Israel Today magazine, which is now in English, I saw it in German. I met uh, Ludwig Schneider, the publisher. This is a magazine you all need to get, by the way. And um, I could see the tears in their eyes. I said, boy, these Swiss Germans, they're not like the German Germans. They're not like the Austrian Germans. And, you know, they're kosher also. And so during the reception, they're all hugging me and kissing me and loving me like Christians do. And uh, I said, what part of Switzerland are you from? They said, nein, Deutschland. <laughs> no, Germany. Or nein, Österreich. They're from, no, they were from Austria. I said, I'm in the lion's den. These are all Nazis. <laughs> because Jews think that all Germans and all Austrians are Nazis. But these people loved Israel. And then Ludwig Schneider of the Israel Today magazine says to me, you've got to get your books out in German. And I said, I'm not going to work with the Germans. No, you have to. This publisher is a German Christian Zionist. That's a triple oxymoron. <laughs> and his name is Hensler. And he was shut down by the Nazis because in the 1930s he was printing church hymnals. And they said to him, it's okay to print church hymnals. All you have to do is just delete Israel and Zion. And so he laughed and he fell off his chair. He thought it was a joke. The Nazis shut him down. In World War II, they, they sent his 16-year-old son to the Russian front. Remember Hogan's Heroes? Russian front? That was a death sentence for any German to be sent to the Russian front. And so one day, the 16-year-old German kid, Hensler Jr., they say, take, his, take your gun, we're going into the forest shooting. So he thought you shoot bear or deer to supplement their rations. And they could hear the shooting, they went in, and all of a sudden he saw naked women, naked children, and naked men being shot into trenches. And he was supposed to be in the next round of the firing squad. And he said, Jesus Christ, if you are really in heaven, don't let me kill the Jews. And all of a sudden he heard the firing squad commander say, Hensler, raus, Hensler, out of the firing line. And Hensler Jr. never killed one Jew in World War II. I said, these people are going to do my books in German. And praise God, my books are coming out in German now. And the German magazine, Nachricht in Aus Israel, is coming out in English because of me. And God has such a sense of humor because now a Japanese Christian paid for 20,000 editions every month. And the magazine is now coming out in Japanese. So God's word... So God's word is reaching the German people, the Japanese people, the American, the English-speaking people. And I am a very active part. And today, by the way, I use the Koinonia House computer to send my article for the December edition. And uh, I recommend to all of you to get the Israel Today. You can log on to my website. It has a link to Israel Today. And, uh, or there are all kinds of ways to get to the Israel Today magazine. And I, The point I'm saying is today I am madly in love 
with German people. And I don't hate, I only love the Germans. I will fight Nazism to my last breath. I don't hate the Russians, but I'll fight, fight communism to my last breath. And I don't hate the Muslims, and I never did. I love the Muslims, but I will fight Islam to my last breath. And I'll say something else. You know, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and for those of you who are old like me, uh, I grew up with Victory at Sea. I don't know how many of you remember Victory at Sea. This is the musical score written by Richard Rogers to the TV documentary series. And uh, those of you who saw the movie Patton, you know, I lived World War II even though I was born in 1949. I know every battle and every general and every, everything that happened then. And I used to say to myself, and in Hebrew school we used to say this, that the United States made a big mistake by dropping the nuclear weapons on Japan. They should have been dropped on the Germans for what they did to us in World War II. And because of you Christians, I got the cooties so bad that today I say I mourn for the 20 million Germans who died in World War II. And many of these Germans were innocent, many were guilty, but even the guilty were deceived by Satan and then destroyed by Satan. Satan wants to destroy every human being on earth because every human being is created in the image of God. This is my message tonight. If, I, if you don't get anything else from my message tonight, this is my message. We have a God, and I know that Chuck is now teaching Genesis. Genesis means the creation. God is a creation God. He created all of us. Satan wants to kill all of us. Everything that God likes and loves, Satan wants to destroy. That's how you explain 9-11. So my first sin was the sin of hatred. And I was healed by that by going to church, by reading the New Testament, and by learning from the Christians. You know, a lot of Christians say, is this guy saved? Is he a Jew or is he a Christian? And if you ask me, I'll tell you, I don't know. <laughs> and, you know, there's a teaching in the New Testament, ask and will be granted, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will open. So I have asked, and I've been in churches, and then after a few weeks I come back to the church, so if you asked, of course you're a born-again Christian. I said, well... I don't have an answer that will satisfy you, but the same answer will not satisfy the rabbis either. And that is, I brought it before God in my heart. And God says to me, son, don't you snap your fingers at me. When I want you to know, you'll know. Until then, the scales stay on, keep marching and shut up. <laughs> and that's what I'm doing. But I just want you to know that I'm sincere in seeking to know the truth about Messiah. And at, the, at this moment, God is saying, I need you as a Jew of the Jews. Because only a Jew of the Jews can do what has to be done in Jerusalem. Yeah. And that's, uh, we'll talk about that at the end of the message. The second sin is the sin of ignorance. This local yokel country bumpkin, Yellow Rose of Texas, Nancy, <laughs> she knew my Bible. And I was an officer in the Israeli army and uh, just a lieutenant. And I was a senior editor and translator in the prime minister's office. I did not know the Bible. And, you know, tonight I was having dinner with Chuck. And he was quoting to me from Second Chronicles and First Chronicles. Do you know that I've never read First Chronicles and Second Chronicles? I need a Christian to teach me my book, you know. And, and I'm, God willing, I'm going to one of these days get down to reading the, the Old Testament. I read the New Testament many times. I need to read the Old Testament also. Um, I decided to go to seminary, the Jewish Theological Seminary, from 1991 to 1994 to become a conservative rabbi. God had other plans for me. Instead of being a pulpit rabbi with 100 families, I became an unordained teacher to about 20, 30 million Christians. So, <laughs> and, uh, but I learned something in seminary at the very beginning which changed my life forever. And that is, I, we were taught in seminary in Jerusalem five verses from the New Testament. One was about Matthew 23, verse 5, which is the prayer shawl and the phylacteries that Jesus confirms that these existed uh, 2,000 years ago. But the four verses which changed my life forever were Mark 12, 28 to 31. Mark 12, 28 to 31, Jesus, the rabbi, is discussing the law with his fellow rabbis, and the debate is about what is the most important commandment of all. And Jesus says, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy strength, and with all thy might. And um, that's Deuteronomy 6, 4 or 5. The second verse uh, that Jesus teaches is from Leviticus 19, 18. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
And I was shocked because I always thought the New Testament was written by a Catholic priest in Sicily. <laughs> you see, Jews don't know that the New Testament is a Jewish book. Jews are not allowed to read the New Testament. If you read the New Testament, you get the cooties. <laughs> and if you're a Jew, of course. And I get into a lot of trouble with my fellow Jews because I say to my fellow Jews, you Jews need to read the New Testament. They say, ah, oh, Jew for Jesus. And I say, no, I'm not a Jew for Jesus. But when you read the New Testament, you confirm the Old Testament. And they say, well, we don't read the Old Testament. Why should we read the New Testament? <laughs> By the way, there's only one thing worse than Jews for Jesus, and that's Jews for nothing. So then Jesus does something very remarkable. He says, there are no commandments greater than these two. Love the Lord thy God, love thy fellow as thyself. Out of the 613 commandments, these are the two most important commandments. What is the verb? L-O-V-E. So I've taken the liberty of saying that the whole Bible can be distilled into a four-letter word. L-O-V-E. Our God is a God of love. Our book is a book of love. And Messiah has to be a Messiah of love. And I was very shocked by all of this because Jews don't know that this is at the heart of the New Testament, that these are the two most important teachings according to Jesus of Nazareth. And here I am going to Christian churches, and all I see in the churches is love, love, love. It's overwhelming for Jews who have never seen this. And praise God, I've been in over 400 churches of many, many denominations. Why do we have to love God? I mean, this, this may sound so trivial. Like, you've, you've heard these teachings dozens of times, if not hundreds of times. And I'm going to come from a very, very special uh, perspective. It's a perspective I couldn't do three years ago. I've been a grandfather for three years. When you are a father or mother, or when you are a grandfather or grandmother, you have a different perspective on life. And I think I'm specially qualified now to speak because of my uh, status now as a grandfather. Why should we love God? Because God is our father and our mother. You know, normal parents, when they have children, normal parents want only one thing, and that is for their children to love them. What makes parents happy? When, you know, you look at your child smiling at you, beaming at you. What makes parents upset? When the kids don't care about you. Why should we love our fellow as ourself? Because our fellow as ourself is created in the image of whom? God. What makes parents happy? When brothers and sisters, or brothers and brothers and sisters and sisters, grow up together and love each other and caress each other and help each other, the happiness that it gives the parents to see their children together. What makes parents upset when kids are not together? And when they're fighting each other and cursing each other and abusing each other and stabbing each other and shooting each other. And you know that there are families where siblings kill each other. And let me tell you, coming from Israel, I can tell you that the worst possible punishment for a parent is to bury a child. And I've been in the military cemeteries enough time burying children who are friends of my sons in the Israeli army. But it doesn't have to be in the army. Any child who dies in the lifetime of the parent, this is maybe the most terrible punishment for a parent. And I translate this into how God must feel when any human being dies or is persecuted or suffers. God cries for all of us when we die or when we suffer. This is why Jesus says, love the Lord thy God, love thy fellows thyself. Also, you cannot love God if you hate any human being. What does Jesus teach? I get into trouble for preaching this in the synagogues. Love your enemy. The Muslims are my enemy, but I love them. I don't hate them. I wish they could be saved. So it's all about love. And one of the things I've learned is that when you hate, it's like you prepare a vial of poison for the person you hate, but in the end you drink the poison. And people who hate do not live very long. You want to live a long life? You have to be a lover. You have to love. You have to love God, and you have to love your fellow human being. Why am I teaching this, these two commandments this way? And the reason is very simple. The first deception of Islam is that it is a religion of love. Now, are Muslims loving people? Sure they are. They're wonderful people. Why? They're created in the image of 
God. God is a loving God. If we're in God's image, we have the potential to be loving people. Let me ask you a question. And I couldn't answer this until I was giving this message. Are German people loving people? Of course they are. But are Nazis? <laughs> Russian people, are they loving people? But are communists? Muslims are loving people. But Islam is not a loving system. And you know how I know? What does Jesus say? Jesus says, the two most important commandments are love the Lord thy God, love thy fellows as self. In the whole Bible, Jesus is confirming in Mark 12 what we see in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus. He's reconfirming and reinforcing what every Jew knows. These two commandments, the two most important commandments, they are not in the Quran. I will pay anyone here a million dollars if you can show me where these two commandments are in the Quran. And the Saudis were picking on me because this is my message. And they say to me, they say in the article, Avi Lipkin says there's no love in the Quran. I didn't say that. The word love appears 24 times in the Quran. Allah loves this, Allah loves that. <laughs> but the context, the commandment, love the Lord thy God, love thy fellows thyself, not in the Quran. Now, if I'm a Jew or if I'm a Christian, then this has to start the red lights blinking. Something is wrong with the Quran. Something is wrong with the Islamic religion. So that's the first deception. Islam as a religion, as a system, is not a, a system of love. Muslims are loving people. Let's look at King David. This will lead me into the next deception, but it's the, it's the link from the first deception to the second. We all love King David. King David is the forefather of the Messiah. Jews love King David. Christians love King David. But King David was disqualified by God from building the temple. Why? He was a man of the, the sword. He had blood on his hands. What's the problem with the sword? The sword is an instrument of death of human beings created in the image of God. And so God has placed a curse on the sword and anyone who holds the sword. And yet the sword is the symbol of Islam. You ever seen the Saudi flag? A green flag with gold letters. There is no God but Allah. And his prophet is Muhammad. And underneath it is a scimitar sword. Solomon was the one who built the temple because Solomon made love, not war. <laughs> it says in the Bible, when you build an altar unto me, do not use any iron implements because iron implements are implements of death. Is it fair to assume that God does not like the sword? Why? Because the sword kills those created in the image of God. So we're talking about the two commandments that Jesus says are the two most important commandments. Love the Lord thy God, love thy fellows thyself. So let's look now at the religion of peace. Islam claims to be the religion of peace. Your president in Washington, D.C. says Islam is a religion of peace. And the, I mean, I know he does this for tactical reasons, but the, the word Islam comes from the word salam. It's a three-letter root, just like in Hebrew, shalom, which means peace. But the word does not mean peace. It comes from peace, but it doesn't mean peace. It means pacification. You know, pacification comes from peace. How many people here remember the good old days of the Vietnam War? You remember the word, this Viet Cong village was pacified? Usually it meant immolated in napalm. Pacified meant that Viet Cong village did not exist anymore. It was burned out and all the Vietnamese were killed. That's usually what pacification meant. That's what Islam means. Islam means the destruction of the infidel, the suppression or the defeat of the infidel. By its very definition, Islam says there are two houses. There is the house of Peace, and there's the house of war. Well, isn't that wonderful? Don't we all want to be the house of peace? The only problem, there's a catch. To be a member of the house of peace, you have to be a Muslim. Anybody who's not of, the, of a Muslim is the house of war. Now, the Islamic definition of peace is when the house of peace conquers the house of war, when the good guys beat the bad guys. Now, there's only one problem with that. Five-sixths of the human race is not Muslim. You've got two billion Christians and Jews, mostly Christians, one billion Hindus, 
two billion Buddhists, five-sixths of the human race, and then 1.2 or 1.3 billion are Muslims. I want to tell you a joke. I promised you some jokes. What's the difference between neurotic people and psychotic people? Neurotic people dream about castles in the air. Psychotic people live in castles in the air. And psychiatrists collect the rent. <laughs> now, Adolf Hitler was psychotic for many reasons. I will focus on two. He thought he could conquer the earth, and he thought he could kill the Jews. These are the two most extreme psychoses of Adolf Hitler. Now, firstly, nobody can conquer the earth. Alexander the Great tried it. The Romans tried it. Napoleon tried it, Hitler tried it, Stalin tried it. Only the Lord has dominion over the earth. No human being can do this. So this is the first psychosis. Anybody who believes that they can conquer the earth, they're psychotic. Second psychosis of Hitler, he thought he could kill all the Jews. Well, in God's kingdom terminology, Jeremiah 31, it says there will be no more Jews on the face of the earth when the moon, the sun, and the stars stop shining. So what does that mean? You better pay for the Jews. Because when the Jews go, there'll be no more moon, sun, or stars, which means no more earth. In this kingdom terminology, if the Jews were sinful and stubborn and stiff-necked, as it says in the Bible, and God said, I will scatter you to all corners of the earth, well, if you can't conquer the earth, you can't kill all the Jews because you can't reach them. So that's the second psychosis. There's no way that all the Jews will be killed. So Adolf Hitler was psychotic. He thought he could conquer the earth, and he thought he could kill the Jews. Well, what does Islam preach? That they can conquer the earth. That's just as bad as the Nazis. They can kill all the Jews, which is just as bad as the Nazis. But the Muslims take it a few steps more. They're going to kill all the Christians, 2 billion, all the Hindus, 1 billion, and all the Buddhists, 2 billion. That's 5 six of the human race. And then when everybody else is dead, what do the Muslims do? They kill each other. Because you've got some Muslims that are more kosher than other Muslims. Okay? Now, I did a TV show last year, October 18th, with Jerry Falwell. And it was a very good show. Of course, I was surprisingly politically correct. <laughs> After the show, I said to Jerry Falwell, I said, you know, Jerry, we're off the air now. I've got to tell you something. I disagree with you. So Jerry Falwell, you know, such a nice guy and so loving brother and... He says to me, what do you disagree with? Well, I said to him, you said that Islam was an evil religion. How many people remember that Jerry Falwell said that Islam is an evil religion? And Franklin Graham said it, and Pat Robertson said it, and all three of you got death sentences from Islam. And I want you to know I disagree with you. He says, you disagree with me? Yes, Islam is not an evil religion because Islam is not a religion. Islam is a psychosis. Islam is a sickness. And let me ask you a question. When somebody is sick, are you supposed to hate them? You're supposed to heal them. You know what that means? As Christians, you are to witness to the Muslims. And you know what my motto is? Either you bring the Muslims, or rather, either we bring the Muslims to the Lord, or they're going to bring us to the sword. You bring the Muslims to the Lord, or they're going to bring you to the sword. We don't have time tonight. In my nine-hour teaching, I tell about Muslims who became born-again Christians, and they went from being murderers and terrorists to lovers of the Jews and the Christians. It is a mindset. It is a psychological condition to be a Muslim. So after they kill the Jews, the Christians, the Hindus, the Buddhists, you have the utopia, Islamic utopia. Now, what is utopia in English? Utopia means pretty darn good place, right? Perfect place. In Greek, I know Chuck loves uh, Greek, so how do you say utopia in Greek? It's eutopia. Eu in Greek means no. Topia means place, like topography. Eutopia, no place. There is no such place as a utopia. That's what the Greek means, that there isn't such a place. So let's look at the Islamic utopia, because there isn't such a place. Afghanistan. Afghanistan was a country of Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, and Christians. The first to go were the pagans, the Hindus and the Buddhists. Then the Jews and the Christians were next to go. And then there were only Muslims left. And what did the Muslims do in Afghanistan? They killed each other. Do you know that in the last 10 years, 
Over a million Afghanis have been killed by each other. You have the Pashtuns, they are the majority, they're related to the Pakistanis. You have the Tajiks and the Uzbeks related to their brethren in the fellow former Soviet Union. And then they have, they have the Hazaras. The Hazaras are Shiites related to the Iranian Muslims. All Muslims and all slaughtering each other. This is the Islamic utopia. And in the end, who has to pick up the pieces and rebuild the country? The Americans. Let's look at another utopia, Algeria. My wife Rachel comes home from work one day crying. Al Jazeera brought in this Algerian terrorist apprehended by the Algerian government. You know, you don't have four different ethnic groups in Algeria. You have only one ethnic group. They are all Sunni Muslims and they're all Algerians. And this terrorist was a fundamentalist fighting the non-fundamentalist Muslim government. And he's describing how they deal with an infidel village, a village which has been, um, how should I say, considered an enemy of Islam. In other words, Muslims who collaborate with the government in Algiers. We're talking only about Muslims. There are no Jews and there are no Christians in Algeria. And my wife comes home and she needs to take a Valium, a sedative, because she's so hysterical from what she just saw. This guy, this terrorist in very cold manner gets up and he talks about what they do to a village that's considered traitors, fellow Muslims. They wait for the men to go to work at five in the morning, six in the morning, then they go into the village, they circle the village, they don't let anyone in, they don't let anyone out. They go to the women and say, prepare for us a festive meal. And then after they've had their festive meal, they take a hallucinatory drug to go on a high. You know the word in English, assassin? Assassin comes from Arabic. The Arabic word is hashashin, those who smoke hashish, those who get high on drugs and become murderers. Assassin means a murderer. So they take this hallucinatory drug, they slit the throat, first they rape the women, then they slit their throats, then they take the children and the, 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 the old people, they slit their throats. It's not over. Then they use high tech, they take electrical chainsaws and they chop off the arms and the legs. They dismember the bodies, mutilate the bodies, so that when the men come home that night from work, the men know what happens to anyone who makes war on Allah, war on Muhammad the Prophet, and spreads disorder on the earth. And with your permission, the Saudis were attacking me in their article in Al Watan for misquoting the Bible. So I want to be sure that I said it right. Chapter 5, verse 33 of the Quran. Those, by the way, I recommend to all of you, if you have a few bucks, get the Quran with parallel Arabic text, Penguin Classics. It has the Arabic and it has the English. And I'll be referring to the differences between the Arabic and the English. Chapter 5, verse 33 of the Quran. Those that make war against God, Allah, and his apostle, Muhammad, and spread disorder in the land shall be put to death or crucified or have their hands and feet cut off on alternate sides or be banished from the country. They shall be held up to shame in this world and sternly punished in the hereafter. This is what Muslims do to Muslims. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you feel, from what I said, that I hate the Muslims? I'm crying for the Muslims in my heart because I see what they do to each other with this crazy system. I cry for the Germans, for the 20 million who died, when I see what Hitler did to his own people. And the worst case of Islam is Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein did not kill Jews or Christians. He killed his own fellow Muslims. I mourn for the Muslims. We're going to talk maybe a little bit in the second hour about the Palestinians. I mourn for the Palestinians. I don't hate them. I love them and I hurt for them. That's the second deception of Islam, that it is a religion of peace. It is not a religion of peace. It is a religion of eternal war. First they kill the infidel, then they kill each other. And this is because of a prophecy Chuck is teaching this week, Genesis. And I think one of the most terrible, terribly truthful prophecies in the Bible is in Genesis 16, where Hagar is pregnant with Ishmael. And the angel of the Lord appears unto Hagar and says, you're going to have a son. His name is going to be Ishmael because God heard your cries. And he will be the father of many nations. And he will be, listen to this, it says in Hebrew, Pere Adam. Adam means a man, Pere means a mule. 
He will be a wild donkey. Ever seen a wild donkey kicking in all directions? You can't get near it. His hand will be against all his brethren's hands, and all his brethren's hands will be against his hand, and he will dwell in the face of his brethren. Do you know that the rabbis never teach this in synagogue? I had to learn this in church. <laughs> Ishmael will be a wild donkey. His hand will be against all his brethren's hands, and all his brethren's hands will be against his hand, and he will dwell in the face of his brethren. This is prophetic. This is a perfect description of Islam today. And a few chapters later, it says, and Ishmael died. Ishmael died in the face of his brethren. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. You know the American slang? Hey, man, you're in my face. Better get out of my face, or that means war. It comes from the Bible. So the third deception of Islam, who is Allah and who is God? You know, because you've got people who say, we serve the same God. Allah and God are one and the same. And that's the biggest deception of all. And that their God is the God of Ishmael, and our God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So let's first look at our God. Who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and why? And you want to know something? The book of Genesis, like I said before, Chuck is teaching the book of Genesis this is a very important book because everything that's happening today was predicted in Genesis. You know how women are so mistreated in Islam? There's such an enmity against women in Islam? And I learned this from Jane Hansen in Women Aglow, chapter 3, verse 15. God says, I will place a permanent curse on the seed of the serpent and the seed of woman. Who's the seed of woman? That's all of us. Who mistreats women? Islam. Where is their enmity with the women? In Islam. And I'm going to show you that Allah is Satan, is the serpent. You look at the bottom line, look at the behavior. It's, certain, it's the serpent is Satan. Our God is a God of creation. What's the book of Genesis? Book of creation. In the first reading that the Jews read, which is Breshit, it starts with the creation and it ends with it was a generation that did evil and thought evil all day. This is just before Noah, where God decides to destroy the earth. You have the seed of creation and you have the seed of destruction. And I saw something two weeks ago on Saturday I never saw it before in my life. I've read it many times and I never saw it. Noah was a shepherd. Noah was the father of all shepherds because he had to shepherd two of every animal onto the ark. And Noah had to feed all these animals. Some were nocturnal, some were day animals. You know, so he didn't sleep very much. He had to feed the animals. He had to clean up after them. The rabbis say for a year they were on the ark. And then after the flood, he planted a vineyard, got royally drunk. And he was a farmer. So he was the father of the shepherds and the father of the farmers. But that is the seed of creation. Who were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? They were farmers, and they were shepherds. Joseph was a shepherd. His brothers were shepherds. Moses was a shepherd. By the way, you know, when the Hebrews went into slavery, before they were slaves in Egypt, when they emigrated from Palestine during the drought, the Egyptians detested the Israelites because they were shepherds, if you remember that verse. How do you describe Jesus? The good shepherd. Moses was a shepherd unto Jethro. So being a shepherd is a very special thing because you're part of God's creation plan. What do we know about Ishmael? He's a man of the sword. That's part of God's destruction plan. What do we know about Esau? He was a man of the sword because Isaac blessed him with a curse. He said, you will live by the sword. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. What does Jesus say when Peter cuts off the ear of the legionnaire? Put your sword away. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Does Jesus like the sword? I don't like the sword. None of us like the sword. We may have to use it at some stage to defend ourselves, but we should not glorify the sword, and that's what Islam does. In fact, Islam describes itself as Deen Asif. Deen Asif is the law of the sword. Okay? Now, by the way, something which is very important. Remember I was saying how Jesus confirms Deuteronomy and Leviticus, love the Lord thy God, love thy fellow thyself. That's confirmed in Mark. You know, when I preach to Christians 
It's like clapping with two hands because I've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. When I preach to the Jews on Shabbat, I have to clap with one hand <laughs> because I can't use the New Testament, okay? But here we have seven times in the New Testament the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the very, very first, the very, very first um, a mention of this is in the first gospel, the first chapter, the first page, the first words of the New Testament. These are the generations of Jesus Christ, and you have 14 generations, and 14 generations, and 14 generations. What do you have right in the middle of all of that? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It doesn't say Ishmael. So if the Muslims say that it was Ishmael, then we have a problem. Is God a liar? Is God crazy? Is God schizophrenic? Or maybe is the Islamic book wrong? Now, God says five times in Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. First, he says it, if you remember, when, I, when Abraham is 99. And God says, you're going to have another son. And his wife is 90. And Abraham almost falls off his chair laughing. And Sarah's in the tent listening. She's laughing. So what's the kid's name? Laughter. Isaac means laughter. And God said, you know, Abraham was a humble man, and he loved his son Ishmael. We never see that Abraham hated Ishmael. He loved Ishmael. And God says, it is not through Ishmael. Ishmael will be blessed. He'll be father of 12 nations. But it is through Isaac your seed will be called. And then the second time we see when Isaac is being weaned from Sarah, and Abraham gives a party, and it says in the King James, I'm going to teach you some Hebrew now, it says in the King James, Sarah saw Ishmael behaving in a haughty manner. How many people know that verse? He was behaving in a haughty manner with Isaac. But you see, the King James is a very Puritan book. Hebrew is a very sexy language. And so this was mistranslated. The word is Sarah saw uh, Ishmael behaving in a litzachek manner. Litzachek, do you remember when Isaac and Rebekah were in the, with the king of the Philistines? And he said, she, he said, this is my sister, not my wife, because he was afraid they'd kill him and take the wife. And then the king of the Philistines saw him sporting with his wife. And then he understood that it was his wife and not his sister. This must have been a typical thing. I, you know, Abraham also said that Sarah was his sister uh, to the Pharaoh. Do you remember Potiphar's wife trying to seduce Joseph? And when he was not going to be seduced, she says to her husband, why did you bring this Hebrew slave to make sport of us, to, make, to mock us? The word is litzachek. Litzachek is, has a sexual connotation, sexual foreplay, sexual abuse. So Ishmael was behaving in a sexually abusive manner to his three- or four-year-old brother who had just been weaned to show his dominance. This is a very Middle Eastern thing, to physically, to sexually abuse someone to show that you are dominant. It's a very Middle Eastern thing. That's why Sarah said, this child will not inherit Abraham. Out. That was the reason he, they were banished. The third time, God says, take your one and only begotten son, Isaac, and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. But the Muslims say it's not Isaac, it's Ishmael. And they have a holiday called Eid al -Adha. Eid al -Adha is the sacrifice of Ishmael. And by the way, does anyone know where Ishmael was supposed to be sacrificed? Was it Jerusalem? Was it Mount Moriah, like Abraham? No. Mecca, at the Black Stone at the Kaaba, the holiest site of Islam, because Abraham, according to the Islamic tradition, built the Kaaba. So these people are living in another solar system. <laughs> and I think it's interesting that Jerusalem is never mentioned in the Quran, and Mecca is never mentioned in the Bible. This is not a question of sibling rivalries. You know, psychiatrists say this is sibling rivalries. What difference does it make? No, this is a, the spirit of good versus evil, of God versus Satan of those who are anointed versus those who are not anointed. And you know, in every family, you're going to have children, sons and daughters, maybe one or two will be born again. The others, they're, they're good kids, but they're not anointed. So in every family, you may have one, maybe, if you're lucky. If you're lucky, you'll have more that are there dedicated to serve God. And the others are dedicated to have a good time, make money, and, you know, this kingdom. <laughs> I know, it's in my family, too. So then you remember when, after the sacrifice, Sarah gets a heart attack and drops dead. You know, when she hears that her only son is going to be sacrificed on Mount Moriah, she dies from this. And so Abraham is 147. He takes Keturah as his wife. Abraham has a whole slew of children. 
He has concubines, no Viagra in those days. And God says, send all these kids away. Give them gifts. It is through Isaac your seed will be called. There was an anointing here. God is very clear. He says it's five times in Genesis. And it's repeated in the Gospel of Matthew. And yet there are Jews who prostrate themselves to the Muslims. They prostrate themselves to Arafat, to the Islamic agenda. And you've got Christians who prostrate themselves to Arafat and the agenda. You've got a pope. I don't want to attack the pope. He's done a lot for relations with the Jews and with Israel. But he goes to Damascus and kisses a Quran in the mosque in Damascus. Or you've got the World Council of Churches from the Protestants that embrace Islam. These people are legitimizing the religion that delegitimizes us. So any Jew, and especially any Christian who supports Islam, is a heretic and an infidel. This is heresy to support Islam in any way, because Islam is not legitimizing but delegitimizing the Jews and the Christians. Let's look at Allah. Allah is one of 360 pagan gods. Now, Allah generically means God. You know, in Hebrew, you have Elohim. In Arabic, you have Allah. But there's another Aleph, Lamed, Hey, A-L-H, root. Ela means moon crescent. Al-Ilahi means moon crescent, God. It says in Deuteronomy, anyone who prays to the moon, the sun, and the stars should be taken to the gates of the city and stoned. This is in Deuteronomy 20. The three greatest gods of the 360 of ancient Mecca were the moon, the sun, and the stars. Muhammad heard voices. He had epilepsy, and as part of his condition, he heard voices. And so he comes to his wife, Khadija, and says, I'm hearing voices during my epileptic seizures. Am I a prophet or am I crazy? He knew there was something wrong. He asked his wife. So what is his wife going to say? You're nuts? She says, oh, mon chéri, of course, you are the greatest and the latest of all the prophets. So he goes to the Jews and he goes to the Christians. He says, I'm greater than Moses and I'm greater than Jesus. So the Jews and the Christians say, you know, you're nuts. So now he's ticked off. So his wife says, I'm going to create a religion greater than the religion of the Jews and the Christians. I'm going to create a God greater than their God. Have you ever heard the call to prayer of the Muslims? Where they say, Allah, Akbar. Forgive me for doing this in this house of God. But CNN translates that as God is great. Isn't it wonderful that God is great? Don't we know that God is great? But if CNN says it, better watch out. Because that's not what it means. Allah Akbar means Allah is greater. Allah is greater? Allah is greater than the God of the Jews and the Christians who rejected Muhammad. Their God is the God of Ishmael, the forefather who was a war forefather. Allah is a war God, and Muhammad is a war prophet. Our God is a God of peace and a God of love. In other words, our God is a wimp. Their God is the war of the God of the sword. That's a macho God. That's, of course, their God is greater than the God of the Jews and the Christians. That's what they believe. So, Allah is greater than God. Who said he was greater than God before his fall? Satan. Lucifer. Allah is Satan. Allah is Lucifer. I am like a lawyer in court trying to make my case. And I've just proven my case in theory. Now I'm going to prove it in practice. What have I learned in Christian churches, 400 of them? That the Jews are the apple of God's eye. It says so in the Bible. You know what I answer the Christians? You Christians are the apple of God's eye because you're grafted into us. I mean, if we're not the apple of God's eye, I don't think you want to be grafted into us. You want, you want, you want to be grafted into us? You better hope that we're the apple of God's eye. <laughs> I mean, if you believe in Romans 9 to 11. And by the way, I believe in Romans 9 to 11. I get into a lot of trouble with the Jews when I say that. And I believe there's a reason. And the reason is the Jews sinned. The Jews did not share the gospel. They didn't teach God's word to the nations. Instead, we have these kosher laws. Kosher laws upon kosher laws upon kosher laws. And when Jesus says, a burden too grievous to be born, he's right. But on the other hand, it doesn't mean you should throw the baby out with the bathwater. And you are under the law. But it's a different kind of law. You know, the Muslims, they're not under the law. You know why? Because none of those laws are in the Quran. Love the Lord thy God. Love thy fellow as thyself. Not in the Quran. Jesus teaches the Ten Commandments, not in the Quran, except for one, thou shalt not kill. But it's also, it's a little different. In the Quran, it teaches, thou shalt not kill any man whom Allah has not deemed that you should kill, except for a just cause. <laughs> you can kill for a just cause. 
You can lie for a just cause. You can steal, rape, destroy, burn, enslave for a just cause. That's, so Islam is not under any law, that's for sure. Chapter 5, verse 51 of the Quran. This I always start off with. Believers, Muslims, take neither the Jews nor the Christians for your friends. The Jews and the Christians are friends with one another. Whoever befriends them will become one of their number. Allah does not guide the wrongdoer. See, the Saudis quote me as saying that, but they, they change the quote. But every Muslim, like if I say to you, Romans 8, 28, everybody knows what that is. You know, that all things work for good for those who love the Lord. So all I have to say to you is, if you're a Muslim, Surah 5, verse 51, everybody knows what that is. Don't take the Jew or the Christian for your friend. But the Saudis, they try to obfuscate. Here it says in the Quran, do not take the Jew or the Christian for your friend. Allah does not guide the wrong door. It's a death sentence for anyone to take a Jew or a Christian for a friend, sincerely. When the Muslim says to you that he's your friend or she's your friend, they're either lying to you or lying to Allah. It could be that they're lying to Allah. And if they really are, love them and pray for them. If they are lying to you, also love them and pray for them, but don't turn your back. Chapter 5, verse 60 of the Quran. And again, I want to quote this properly. Now, this is, you, you see, you can't just read the Quran. You have to be trained how to read the Quran. Shall I tell you who will receive a worse reward from God, from Allah? Those whom Allah has cursed and with whom he has been angry, transforming them into apes and swine and those who serve the devil. Worse is the plight of these, and they have strayed farther from the right path. Now, do you know who the children of the apes and the children of the swine are? The Jews and the Christians. And I have to tell you, my wife comes home <laughs> crying from her work, and she hears Friday is the worst day because that's what they preach on the mosque. In the, on Temple Mount. And Sheikh Sabri says, kill the Jews, kill the Christians. Kill the Israelis, kill the Americans, kill the children of the apes, and kill the children of the swine. Every Palestinian Muslim schoolchild knows that the children of the apes are the Jews and the children of the swine are the Christians. Every true believing Muslim knows this verse. If you read the Quran and I didn't tell you that, you don't know. You think children of the apes, children of the swine must be some mythological thing. Generic. No, it's the Jews and the Christians. The Hadith, which is another form of teaching, not in the Quran, teaches that on the day of judgment, there will be a final battle. And every Jew on the face of the earth will be destroyed. It will kind of like Adolf Hitler. And there will be some Jews who temporarily evade death. They will hide behind rocks and trees. And on that day, Allah will give mouths to the rocks and trees, and they will call out, oh, Muslim pursuers, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. So let me ask you a question. Does Allah love the Jews? He loves them dead. Is that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? If, if we are the apple of God's eye, and if the world will be destroyed if there are no more Jews on the face of the earth, can that be God? That can only be Satan. So this is the third deception of Islam. By the way, another little story about my dear wife. I'm away from my wife eight months of the year, unfortunately. Sometimes she travels with me, but she works in the Israeli radio. She's a civil servant. She has one month a, a, a year of vacation time. So most of the year she's there alone and she goes and fills up the car in French Hill gas station. And the, it's in a Jewish neighborhood, but the gas station attendants are Muslims. They're Palestinian boys. My wife is a beautiful woman. Some of you have met her. And she used to be on TV. My wife was a TV announcer for 12 years in Arabic, and she's kind of a TV star in Israel among the Arabs. And they give her a red carpet treatment, and uh, very sweet, these, these Palestinian boys. And just a few months ago, she went to fill up with gas, and they said to her, Rachel, you know, you were born in Egypt. Arabic's your mother tongue. You know us. We know you. You, you understand our culture. You're part of us. But we have a little problem with you. You're a Jew. And you know that on the Day of Judgment... We're going to have to kill all the Jews. And Allah will give mouths to the rocks and trees, and they will call out, oh, Muslim pursuers, there's a Jew hiding behind, behind us. Come and kill that Jew. And we don't want to kill you. Rachel, we love you. We don't want to kill you. But we will kill you if you don't become a Muslim. Because Allah has commanded us. So, you see, what I'm sharing with you is not academic. What I'm sharing with you is the marching orders of the Islamic peoples. 
kill the Jew, kill the Christian. And one of the things my wife said to me in, when she was in Egypt was, the Jews are the Saturday people, the Christians are the Sunday people. We'll kill the Jews on Saturday, we'll kill the Christians on Sunday. There is no difference between what is happening now to the American troops in Iraq or the Western troops. Today they killed, unfortunately, almost 20 Italians. Christians killed. They kill the Jew, they kill the Christian. We are the Ahel El Kitab. This is the third deception of Islam. We have another five minutes, we'll finish this first hour, which is an hour and a half already. <laughs> Fourth deception, this is very fast now. Jesus Christ of Islam is the same Jesus Christ of Christianity. And what do the Muslims say? Jesus will come back a second time as a Muslim. That's pretty funny. Because Islam was created about seven centuries after the life of, and crucifixion of Jesus. But he comes back a Muslim. That's okay. He's reincarnated as a Muslim. And he comes down from the Golan Heights. He faces off against the Antichrist in battle and kills him with a spear. The Antichrist, of course, has to be a Jew, according to the Islamic tradition. And um, how do we know that the Antichrist cannot be a Jew, by the way? What is the sign of the Antichrist? 666. Well, we know Jews are 599. <laughs> By the way, I heard that from a Christian, and when I heard that, I got so angry and so flustered. I said, that's the most anti-Semitic thing I ever heard in my life, and then I just started laughing so hard. I said, I'm going to use that joke every time. <laughs> so Jesus kills the Antichrist, goes up to the Temple Mount, prays with 400,000 Muslims the morning Islamic service. Then Jesus the Muslim comes down, breaks all the crosses with his 400,000 Muslims. This is basically a pogrom. It's a riot, basically. They destroy all the churches of the Christians. They destroy all the synagogues of the Jews. And on that day of judgment, all the Jews and the Christians who are considered one people, the Jews and the Christians are the Ahl al-Kitab, one people, the people of the book. All the Jews and the Christians who have not embraced Allah as the greatest of all the gods, remember, 360 gods, and Muhammad, the greatest and latest of all the prophets, all these Jews and Christians will have their throats slit by Jesus Christ, the Muslim. Is that the same Jesus? If you don't understand what I just said, I have a $3 Clinton bill in my wallet. I'll be glad to show it to you afterwards. <laughs> the fifth deception of Islam is that the Quran is the divine infallible word of Allah to Muhammad and that the Quran replaces the Bible of the Jews and the Christians. And I need an hour to do this, but I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to give you a few sentences. And if you're interested, uh, get my first book, which is, is Fanatic Islam, a Global Threat. Because in addition to predicting 9-11 already in 1997, the book talks about kamikaze pilots and, and destruction of America. But it also teaches in chapter 19 about the numerology, the num numer number, numerological code of 19 in the Quran, uh, which is a very Jewish number, by the way, because the Quran was written by a rabbi. And there are 117 chapters in the Quran, but 22 of them begin, 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. 22 chapters of the Quran start with the letters A-L-M. Nobody knows what this means in the Islamic world, but the rabbi who taught me this said that A-L-M means anilo ma'amin, I don't believe any of this, or elelelo mashma, these verses mean nothing. <laughs> the Quran could not have been written by a Muslim because the Muslims were illiterate nomads. What they did was they hijacked a Jewish rabbi and a Armenian Orthodox or Syrian Orthodox priest, put them in a pit, made them write the Quran, and then killed them, even though they promised them their freedom. So these are the five deceptions of Islam, and I could go indeed into depth as to how the Quran is a, is a plagiarism, a fabrication, or a fraud. But what I want to basically conclude with before we take our little break, and then we continue, is that Islam is a system which has a plagiarism as a book, has a Satan as a god, has a um, uh, an epileptic prophet who heard voices when he fell to the ground with his epileptic seizures. It is a religion of war and it is a religion of hatred. And uh, God have mercy on all of us from this Islam and God have mercy on the Muslims themselves. And uh, before we take our break, I just want to say again and again, pray for the Muslims, love the Muslims, be a witness to them, and don't turn your backs. Thank you very much. We are going to talk about three subjects during the next hour. The first subject is plans by the Muslims in Canada to kill all the Jews in Canada. And uh, I <coughs> project this prediction in, into the United States of America, South America, France, Europe, every country where there are Muslims and Jews living side by side, this is a plan which the Muslims are planning. The second is the Saudi plan for 
um, hitting Israel with nuclear-tipped missiles. Iranians will hit Israel with nuclear-tipped missiles. Libya will hit Israel with nuclear-tipped missiles. The Egyptians, the Syrians, these, these countries do not need these weaponries <coughs> excuse me, of mass destruction. And the third and final um, subject is a little bit on the, I don't want to call it eschatological side, but I'm going to uh, share something which I think none of you have ever heard before, and it is what I think is the days of the Messiah, my view of the days of the Messiah, uh, my view of the days of reconciliation in which the Jews and the Christians will finally stop hating each other. By the way, Christians and Christians will stop hating each other. And Jews and Jews will stop hating each other. And the Muslims will be saved, those who survive the march against Jerusalem. And I believe the Third Temple will be rebuilt. I don't want to talk about whether or not I believe in uh, animal sacrifices or just it should be a house of prayer for all nations. My personal preference, of course, I don't want to get into it, but my personal preference is not animal sacrifices. I think we should have a house of prayer for all nations. But it is scriptural. And a lot of Christians and a lot of Jews believe that there should be animal sacrifices. I personally think we've graduated. We don't go back to that. Uh, but I believe that God wants a temple there, and the mosques are an abomination, and I think God himself will remove the mosques. Um, and I am thinking that uh, if we believe in democracy, I believe that Israel, as a democratic country, will eventually have a Judeo-Christian political party, and that the Jews and the Christians will be reconciled through, through this political party, and a party which does not even exist today, by the way, except in what I think God is saying to me, in my thoughts and in my heart. And, um, but I have a feeling, I have a prediction, that there will be a Judeo-Christian political party in the Knesset, and I think that it will be the biggest party in Israel in 10 years from now. And I'll explain to you, when you understand the first and second parts of the message, you'll understand why this is the logical conclusion. So, I want to start with a joke. This is a joke for old people from 1955. It is from the Bandung Peace Conference. And as you may remember, there was the capitalist world in the 50s, and there was the socialist, uh, the communist world in the 50s, and then there was the third world, the developing nations. And the joke is that uh, Nasser is meeting, Nasser of Egypt is meeting with Mao Zedong of China, and uh, Nasser is crying on Mao Zedong's shoulder. Uh, telling him about this terrible, implacable enemy, Israel. And uh, Mao Zedong says, uh, oh, your enemy is Israel? How many are they? And Nasser says, 1955, two million Israelis. So, uh, so Mao Zedong says, ah, two million Israelis, very interesting. Tell me, what hotel are they staying at? And I want to tell you, that was in 55. Praise God, today Israel is a country of 5 million Jews. But I still say, what hotel are they staying at? And in America, we should have been 10 or 11 or 12 million Jews. We're only 5 million Jews. And the reason that there are so few Jews is that Jews have a new idolatrous religion, and it's called the career. And the career replaces Judaism. And so the Jews agree that homosexuality is okay. Jews agree that abortion is okay. I'm not talking about the Orthodox, but the Orthodox are only 10, 15%. I'm talking about the so-called conservative and reform. And I myself am a conservative Jew, but I'm also a conservative politically, so of course I oppose abortion and I oppose homosexuality. But worst by far is the career. The career is a pagan religion. Everything has to be sacrificed so that the young Jewish man or woman can advance in life. And so Jews go basically until about 40 years of age, uh, going for a doctorate, post-doctorate, post-post-doctorate, and then they have to work three, four years to pay off the loans. And by the time they are ready to marry, they are 40 years old. They usually marry a non-Jewish spouse, and then they uh, adopt a child from China. <laughs> so the Jews have basically decided to self-destruct. That's why I wrote my book, Christian Revival for Israel Survival, because we need the Christians to have a revival for Israel to survive. Um, I had dinner, a very special dinner with uh, Chuck, and we were talking, and uh, you know, the, there are some people who talk about one-third of the Jews being killed in the Holocaust, and there is a scripture in Zechariah 13 that two-thirds of the Jews are destroyed by a Holocaust. 
And so, you know, I explained to Chuck my vision of that, that one-third were killed in the Holocaust in Europe, and one-third were killed in the Holocaust in the United States of America. It was not a Holocaust of concentration camps. It was a Holocaust of love and limitless opportunities for Jews to become the president of the United States, to become astronauts, to become generals in the U.S. military, to become businessmen, to become doctors, to become lawyers. There is no position in America today close to the Jews. But there's a price to be paid. You have to sacrifice the Sabbath, you have to sacrifice the festivals, you have to sacrifice kosher, you have to sacrifice everything in order to get ahead in the career. This has become an idolatrous religion for the Jews, replacing Judaism. So God is saying to the Jews, you don't want to be Jews? Okay, you won't be Jews. That's how God is. God's very fair. So today, the Jews are 5 million in America. I was born in America in 49, and I always used to boast, we Jews are the number two after the Christians in America. America is a Judeo-Christian country. Well, something has changed. Since 1979, the Iranian Revolution, the Ayatollah Khomeini Revolution, something has changed. And what has changed, and that is the Islamic invasion of America, the Islamic invasion of Canada, the Islamic invasion of every Christian country on the face of the earth. And today I estimate that the Islamic population is somewhere between 15 to 20 million, whereas the Jews are only 5 million. And America today, very unfortunately, is a Judeo-Christian Islamic country, which for me is like saying America is a God-Satan country, America is a good, evil country, America is a sane, insane country. Because the moment you mix Islam with Judeo-Christianity, there's something wrong. And I want to emphasize, there are two major myths in America today. One myth is that there are three great monotheistic religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And I say that's a myth. That's a lie. There's only one religion. It is the religion of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, shared by the root and the branch, by the Jews and the Christians. And Islam is the antithesis of Judeo-Christianity. I shared this in the first hour, and I'm emphasizing it again. That's why I had to do it. I'm building on the foundations of the first hour. The second myth is that there are three great monotheistic books. No, that's not true. There's one great monotheistic book, the Bible, of the Jews and the Christians. And the Quran is the antithesis. It is the replacement. Our God is God. Their God is Satan. And you cannot mix Islam in the same breath with Judeo-Christianity, and you cannot say Quran together with the Bible. <clears throat> so Islam, and again, I need a lot of time, I could develop this. Islam has invaded America mostly through the universities, mostly through bribery with a lot of money. And so today now you have a, a, a new reality that the Jews are outnumbered three to one, four to one in America and basically the same ratio in every country, in Europe and Canada, in South America. I want you to know something. I flew in yesterday. It was very nice to fly into Coeur d'Alene. I kind of felt like I was cheating, you know, because usually I drive to Coeur d'Alene from New York, and I drive to California, and I drive up to Canada, and I drive down to Mexico, and, you know, it's, I love driving very much, and um, many times I pick up testimonies as I'm driving. And I'll give you like two little testimonies, two little tidbits before I start really into this message. I drive down from Edmonton to Calgary to Lethbridge across uh, Crow's Nest to Cranbrook to Cade Hawkins in Cranbrook and then down through the Sandman Crossing Point, Sand Point. And um, this was right after 9-11. And uh, actually, I was coming here to Chuck's ministry. And um, there was nobody. There were no buses, no trucks, no private vehicles. I drive from Canada right up to the American passport control. I mean, you've all done this. And there's even nobody in the window. And it was like twilight zone, completely empty. And um, <laughs> so finally, somebody comes to the window. He has a name tag, Rodriguez. He's Hispanic-American. And... Uh, when, every time I come across the border, I always have my, not my Israeli passport, I have my American passport ready. And uh, he said, nationality. So I flipped out my passport. And he got red in the face. He got angry. He said, I don't want to see your passport. I want to hear your voice. And I said to him, what's going on? And he started checking every box in my van. And I have all these books, Fanatic Islam, Christian Revival. 
videotapes, the Islamic agenda, and he got real mean. And you know what's going on here? And finally, when he under, he said, "Where are you going?" I said, "Chuck Mister." Ah, okay, you're you're clear. You can go. <laughs> See, Chuck Mister has the kosher seal of approval. And he said to me, why was he so tough on me? He says, because you ever hear of profiling? Now, of course, the blacks go nuts when you say profiling or the Hispanics because everybody thinks dark-skinned people are going to be profiled. But the truth was, he said to me, we are profiling blonde, blue-eyed Aryans like yourself. He didn't know I was Jewish, by the way. And he said, why are they profiling blonde, blue-eyed Aryans? Because there are many, many Germans today converting to Islam, blonde, blue-eyed. There are Chechens, there are Bosnians, and there are Albanians and they are being trained to come to America with dynamite and blow themselves up and kill the American people. And so they are profiling blonde, blue-eyed people coming across the border. That was an interesting tidbit. Uh, there's a very, very uh, dear sister of mine in the Lord, Debbie Eustace. I'm driving down from Lethbridge to go to Great Falls, so I'm taking the other road to get onto Highway 15. I'm going to Great Falls. And my wife, Rachel, who's Egyptian, is uh, Egyptian-born, but she has an Israeli passport, so when we got to the window, they said, what nationality? So, well, American, my, and we had a, a, a Sandy from Buffalo, Christian American woman with us, and so she's kosher. Where are you from? Born in Egypt, over to the side. <laughs> Israeli passport, over to the side. So my wife was interrogated quite, quite a bit, and then finally when they understood that we were Jews and we were on the right side of the law, uh, the, the, the passport control officer became very friendly. He said, you know, I have a little tidbit, a little story for you. You guys talk about Islam, I have a little nugget for you. We just got news from the RCMP. Remember the RCMP? I'm smiling with whiplash. Anyway, now, <laughs> no, that was Dudley Do-Right, the RCMP. Anyway, so the RCMP notified the American authorities that 75 Muslim taxi drivers just emigrated to Canada. Where to? To the province of Yukon. Now, you know what the problem with that is? 75 taxi drivers going to Yukon. There are no roads in the Yukon. <laughs> and let me tell you, the Canadians are watching them with a magnifying glass. But they're very near to the pipelines in Canada and not so far from the pipelines in Alaska. Now you begin to understand? So these people are preparing for something long term. And they're sleepers, meaning you don't know about it till all of a sudden it's too late to know about it. Okay, now, now I want to start my message. I'm driving from, Ca uh, from California up on I-5, Interstate 5, to Oregon and then to Vancouver. And I teach three nights in a farmhouse, the place they were hanging from the rafters, like 50, 60 people. Three hours Sunday, three hours Monday, three hours Tuesday. Nine-hour teaching. And that's basically what I have on the table. It's the blue, red, and yellow tapes. It's a nine-hour teaching. Hopefully, with God's help and with Chuck Missler's help, we will turn this now into DVDs or CD-ROMs, whatever. And um, Wednesday, Thursday, I drive two full hard drive days up to Kamaloops. I mean, you probably know these names. You know, when I'm in Texas, nobody heard of any of these names. Kamaloops and, and Kelowna and Blue River and Mount Robson and then across the plains, the high plains to Edmonton. Thursday night, I get in, as usual, by the skin of my teeth, five minutes before I'm supposed to start speaking at this Baptist church in Edmonton. I speak four hours that night with a break in the middle. And uh, 12 Jews came to the church. I was very honored that the Jews, my people, came to hear me in the church. And uh, the next day, Friday, was Erev Shabbat. It was the eve of the Sabbath. And my Christian hostess, Cora Brisboa, uh, from Operation Esther. You have all these Christian ladies. They have all these Israeli Jewish names for their operations. And loves Israel, praise God. And she calls the local Orthodox rabbi and says, we have this Israeli army spokesman from Israel who's here, keeps kosher, keeps Shabbat. And would you be kind enough to host him in your home for the Sabbath? And the rabbi says, sure, send them over. So I go over to the rabbi's house, and the first thing the rabbi says to me, tell me, what's this business with the Christians? What, are you, what, is a, what is a good Jewish boy like you doing in the Christian churches? And I said to him, listen, rabbi, with all due respect to the war hero Israelis and the genius Israelis, I'm sorry, five million Jews in Israel and five million Jews in America cannot defeat 1.3 billion Muslims. But if the Christians are with us, maybe we have a fighting chance. By the way, how many people here heard the Malaysian Prime Minister three weeks ago, Mahathir Mohammed? Do you know what he said? He said the Europeans killed six million Jews in World War II. There are only six million left. 
And you mean to say that we Muslims, 1.3 billion Muslims, can't finish off these 6 million Jews who fight us by proxy? We Muslims have to rethink our strategy so that we can finally defeat the remaining Jews on the face of the earth, meaning to kill them. Do you know that there were 56 countries represented and not one delegate stood up in protest or walked out? Because the Muslim religion teaches the destruction of the Jews. Again, does God love the Jews or does God hate the Jews? God loves the Jews. So if Allah hates the Jews, can Allah be God? It's, just, it's a function of rationality. How can Allah be God? Allah is Satan. Anyway, so the rabbi finally begrudgingly agreed with what I was saying. You have to understand it's very, very unpalatable for Jews to love the Christians or to understand even if we don't love the Christians that we should let the Christians help us. And they're all different types of Jews. The next day, Saturday afternoon, between the afternoon and evening services, there is a 20-minute hiatus between the sun setting, uh, the afternoon service and the evening service, and the rabbi usually gives a teaching. And the rabbi got up and spoke a little bit, and then he said, we have this Israeli army spokesman here. The Christians give him nine hours. We will give him nine minutes. <laughs> and so I get up to speak. And, um, you know, when you're going to do nine hours and nine minutes, you know, I mean, you guys are going to hear basically almost three hours tonight. So you get a third of the message. So nine minutes is very short, so I have to telescope the message. Basically, I just have to give the punchlines. And two liberal Northeast Jews, you know what the liberal Northeast Jews are. They're liberal if you're liberal like they're liberal. But if you're not liberal like they're liberal, they're not going to be very liberal with you. <laughs> and they started shouting me down. They wouldn't let me speak. We're not going to let you speak. Why? Because you hate the Muslims. Did, did, did I say anything tonight that I hate the Muslims? They wouldn't let me speak. So the irony, remember Thursday night I spoke in the Baptist church and 12 Jews came? Well, I came to the Jewish synagogue on Shabbat and there were two Christian women there. One was Cora Briswa, my hostess, and the other was a Messianic Christian woman who was coming every Saturday to the synagogue to learn how Jesus lived and how Jesus spoke and how, in Hebrew and how he prayed. And You want to know about Jesus? Come to synagogue. And uh, even though she was Messianic, she was tolerated by the Jews. They welcomed her. And so she got up and she said, you know, if you're not going to let Avi speak, you know me. Maybe you'll let me speak if Avi agrees. I said, sure, get up and speak. And she said the following. I am a social worker for the government of Edmonton, Canada. And I'm a caseworker for an Egyptian Muslim woman doctor who had to flee from Egypt. What's her story? This woman was kind of a Mother Teresa. You've all heard of Mother Teresa, the Catholic nun in, in India. Well, this was the Egyptian version. A Muslim woman went to the mosque. She prayed as a Muslim woman should pray. Um, she fed the poor. She healed the sick. She was a very, very special doctor. And these people were so poor in the poorest neighborhood of Cairo that nobody could pay her. So she worked basically for free. People would give her eggs and cheese and pita bread, but nobody had money. She was in her 40s, she was single, and she decided, it's called midlife crisis. She decided she has to start thinking about retirement. And so she applied for a visa to Canada to make some money because in Egypt she wasn't gonna make any money. So the Canadian government approved her visa. The next day there was a knock on her door and three Muslim holy men, quote unquote, knocked on her door and they said to her in Arabic, Mabruk. Mabruk in Arabic means congratulations. And she answered them with the standard automatic reply, Allah Allah should give you congratulations too. Why do I have congratulations? And uh, they said to her, because uh, we know you're going to Canada. So she said, how did you know that? That was just approved yesterday. And they said, we have our fanatic Muslims everywhere in the Egyptian government, everywhere in the Egyptian administration, and we know everything about you. And yes, we also have congratulations in store for us. She says, why? Well, you're going to Canada, and you're going to work for us. So she said, well, what does that mean? They said to her, well, you're going to be our spy. You're going to have a clinic in Edmonton, Canada. And you're going to know within a very short time who all the Jews are. And you're going to know who all the Christians who love Israel are. And you're going to take their names, addresses, telephone numbers, car license plate numbers, their places of employment. You're going to take all their vital statistics because you're going to, have, you're going to be a doctor and you're going to have all this information on file when people come to you for treatment. And then you're going to give us all the information and when we give the orders from the Middle East, all these Jews and Christians who love Israel or are intermarried with Jews, all these people will be slaughtered. 
So this Muslim woman doctor said, listen, I'm a good Muslim woman. I pray every day in the mosque. I think I fulfill the, the commandments of Islam. Uh, I'm also a woman who gives charity. I work for free. I heal the sick. I feed the poor. I swore the Hippocratic oath to save lives, not take lives. I'm not interested in politics. I don't understand politics. And I'm definitely not into killing Jews or any other human beings. She was a good Muslim woman. I don't say that there are not good Muslims. 90% of them, I believe, are good. And I'll tell you why I say 90%. So the three holy men said to her, okay, you don't want to work for us. So she said, no, I don't want to work for you. So standing next to this woman doctor was her best friend, another woman in her 40s, also helping her in the clinic. They grabbed her, pulled out a knife, and they slit her throat. And the woman lay on the floor with all her blood gushing out, dead, and they pointed their finger at the doctor, and they said, if you don't work for us, this is what we're going to do to you. The next day, praise God, this woman had political asylum in the Canadian Embassy in Cairo, and the Royal Canadian Air Force flew in a private jet to spirit her quickly out of Egypt and bring her to this safe house in Edmonton. And this Christian messianic woman was the social worker, the case worker for this Muslim woman doctor. So you see, God has a sense of humor. He took me all the way across the Canadian Rockies, two hard days of drive, in order to shut me up and make me listen which is what my wife does every day for 35 years. <laughs> now, the woman continued, this Christian messianic woman, to say that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police estimate that 90% of Canada's Muslims are good people, that they are law-abiding, peacekeeping people, but that 10% of the Canadians know the agenda. What do the Muslims do? The Muslims buy a forest 30 miles north of Edmonton. They knock down the first concentric circle of trees to build a mosque, an exquisite mosque built to the specifications of the colony that is being planned. Then they knock down the second concentric circle of trees to build the Islamic stores, you know, the halal kosher for Muslim food, kosher for Muslim clothing, kosher for Muslim books, everything that the ummah, that the nation, Islamic nation needs to live. Then the third concentric circle comes down. That's the housing. Then they bring in the troops. And you have to understand that by Islamic law, there's no interest on mortgage loans. So if you are a Muslim and you need a home, uh, they will sell you a home with an interest-free mortgage. And the title of ownership is transferred only after you've completed paying for this mortgage. You don't pay the mortgage. You stay, you stay there. You continue living. But the ownership stays in the hands of the Islamic community. Only after you've paid, you get your home. Now, if you are a Jew or a Christian, you may be a homeless person in the streets of America or Canada. But if you are a Muslim, you will never be homeless because you will go to one of these communities, one of these mosques, and you will be taken care of. The only problem is you have to go to the mosque and you have to do what they tell you. And if that means strapping on a bomb vest, you've got to do that too. So there's a price. And the money comes from Saudi Arabia. And the money from Saudi Arabia comes from you, because you buy gasoline from the Saudis. So basically what's happening today is the Muslims are using the money that you give them to build Islamic colonies, which are exclusive only for Muslims. Jews and Christians cannot live there. By the way, this is all, of course, unconstitutional, but who cares? Constitution only applies to anti-Christian and anti-Jewish decisions. Muslims, of course, always, always get their way. That's the rule of the game. So. Um, Basically, what is happening, and this is what we see happening, is that the Muslims are now prepositioning themselves in every city in Canada, and the Muslims of Edmonton will be responsible for killing the Jews in Edmonton and the Christians who are intermarried with them or loving them, loving Israel, and they know who the churches are that love Israel. And the Muslims of Vancouver will kill the Jews of Vancouver, and those of Toronto will kill the Jews of, Van of Toronto, et cetera, et cetera. Personally, I believe the same applies in the American cities and, and wherever there are Jewish populations and wherever there are Muslim populations, the Muslims will be responsible in each locality for the Jews of their locality. When will this happen? This will happen when there is a war in the Middle East. Something so terrible that orders will come from the Middle East to launch the operation to kill the Jews. Now, by the way, in case you didn't know, 50% to 70% of Jews' marriages in America are intermarriages. You know what that means? It means if you have a guy called Goldberg 
and he marries a Christian woman by the name of O'Malley or Smith, then what happens is she remains a Christian, but she adopts the name of the husband. She becomes Goldberg. And her children, by law, by the Jewish law, are Christian because it's the religion of the mother. So the Goldberg children may be Christian because the mother's a Christian, but they all must die because they have the name Goldberg. And of course, if they know of a Jewish woman who marries a Christian man, the same applies. If they know that the mother is Jewish, then the man and the woman and the children must die because the mother is Jewish. It's a very Nazi thing. You know, the Nazis said if you had one Jewish grandparent, you would be killed in the concentration camps. Muslims have exactly the same thing. <clears throat> when will this happen? When a war breaks out in the Middle East. I'm going to give you a few nuggets of information which will point to where we're going. Israeli intelligence reported two weeks ago that according to their assessments, the Iranians have speeded up the pace of their nuclear weapons program, and they will have the Shihab 3. The Shihab 3 missile is already ready, and they will have it ready to attack Israel within 10 months. So, therefore, the question is, will Israel wait the 10 months? Um, now, by the way, I want to tell you something. In spite of uh, all the praise and flattery of Chuck Missler, uh, that two months before 9-11, I predicted 9-11, uh, I've also made predictions, and I've been wrong. I predicted a war in 96. If we had three hours now, I would be talking very much about the war of 96 that did not happen, but almost did happen. It's in the yellow tapes, the eschatology tapes. The, I predicted a war in 98, which also should have happened and didn't happen. And, you know, God has a sense of humor, praise God, and very often a war is about to happen, then God reshuffles the deck. <laughs> so people like me are very, very often wrong. And in the case of my wife, she says, I'm always wrong. What I'm telling you tonight is what is freely gleaned from the Israeli media. Iran, within 10 months, will have missiles that can hit Israel. But what is even scarier than what the Iranians may or may not have is what we see in the El Salal missile base in the heart of the Saudi Peninsula. To understand the El Salal missile base, we have to go back to the 1980-1988 war between Iran and Iraq. Uh, at that time, Iran was threatening the Arab world, and Iran was seen as an enemy of Saudi Arabia. The Saudis had just purchased AWACS reconnaissance aircraft from President Reagan, and then they came and said, we want intermediate-range missiles, Pershing missiles, in order to shoot at Iran if they attack us. And the United States said to Saudi Arabia, we will give you defensive weaponries, we will not give you offensive weaponries. You do not need missiles. So what did the Saudis do? They went to the Chinese. And the Chinese were very happy to sell them 120 CSS-2 missiles. So this started on a very, very slow uh, key uh, in the 1980s. And then in the summer, August of 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And Saddam Hussein went from being the ally to being the enemy of Saudi Arabia. Now the Saudis were in a panic. And so now they asked the Chinese, and they paid very dearly. Uh, they paid the Chinese for a total of 120 CSS-2 Dong Feng missiles. Now, if you look at the map, you can see the map is point, has a radius with the El Salal missile base in the center of the country. Uh, these missiles can hit uh, Turkey in Chirlik, uh, the American basin in Chirlik. They can hit Western India. You can see Western India on the map. In other words, if a war breaks out between Pakistan and India, uh, the Saudis now provide second strike capability for Pakistan in the w religious war between the Muslims and the Hindus. Uh, but of course, what concerns me most is Israel. Uh, before I get to Israel, don't forget that today you have uh, a lot of American troops in Kuwait, Qatar, uh, Iraq, uh, and um, the American government provided AWACS reconnaissance aircraft to the Saudis, has trained them how to use them. So the Saudis basically today have eyes and ears, and they know where every American troop is in the Middle East. Now, why is this important? You remember the bombings in Riyadh last week? See, a lot of things are now happening that I've been talking about this for months already. Saudi Arabia has two different types of Islamic population. You have the Sunnis and you have the Shiites. The Sunnis uh, are the ruling uh, people. The, the, the 5,000 Saudi princes are all Sunnis. The Shiites are a very, very impoverished, impoverished group of Muslims who are um, uh, discriminated against, uh, and they're very inferior in status in Saudi Arabia. And the Shiites uh, have been issuing ultimatums over the last few months, uh, which my wife has been picking up in Arabic. See, this is never mentioned in your American media. 
But in the, in the Saudi media, the Shiites are saying to the Saudi leadership, you Sunnis better get rid of the Christians who are on our holy land. And if you don't get rid of the Christians, we will. And then we'll get rid of you too. In other words, the Shiites will get rid of the Sunnis. And you know that Saudi Arabia is on the verge of an explosion from within. Now, the missile base has been built by the Chinese, is maintained by the Chinese communists, and they will do the button pushing when the king or the princes of Saudi Arabia give the orders. The only little problem with that is, if the Chinese decide that they want to take Taiwan, Formosa, all they have to do is push a few buttons and launch these 120 missiles at the American troops in the Persian Gulf. And especially since the Pakistanis have provided the nuclear warheads for these missiles, this could mean the end of the American troops in the Middle East. You know, you have an, I mean, praise God, the aircraft carriers are not there anymore. But, you know, one aircraft carrier carries 5,000 sailors. And it, they have escort ships. And so if you, if you plunge a nuclear missile into the sea near these ships, all the ships are gone. Immediately you lose 20, 30, 40,000 American troops. You lose your whole Navy, your whole military capacity. Anyway, this is a conjecture. I don't want to talk about it. Personally, I don't think the Chinese would be stupid enough to do something like this. I think the Chinese are going to wait um, on the side and see how much damage Islam can do to the Judeo-Christian West before the Chinese move into action. But the Chinese want to fight against the West by using the Islamic troops. Anyway, the Chinese are there, and they control and maintain the missile base at El Sulayl, and the Pakistanis have provided nuclear warheads, and these threaten India, they threaten the American troops, and most important to me, of course, they threaten Israel. Now, if you look at the map, it's in Hebrew, but you know that the Israel is those five little letters there, and Israel is so small that Israel has to be written over the Mediterranean Sea. There isn't room on the map to write the name Israel. That's how small it is. And for those of you, God bless you, for those of you who have been in Israel, you know that it is exactly a half hour drive from Tel Aviv, from the Mediterranean coast to Jerusalem, and another 20 minutes to the Jordan River, to the Dead Sea. You can cross Israel in 45 to 50 minutes. And Israel is very long. From Eilat to the Golan Heights, north-south, you can drive in about six hours. That's how big the country is. You know, I'm in Texas, and everybody laughs when I tell them the size. And unfortunately, four nuclear warheads hitting Jerusalem, Haifa, Tel Aviv, and Beersheba, no more Israel. Okay? Now, I think I said this before, and I'll repeat it again. The debate raging today in Iran is the following. By the way, not among the Iranian people. The debate raging among the Islamic religious leadership in Iran. If we nuke Jerusalem, Jesus Christ cannot come back a second time because Jerusalem will be rendered a nuclear graveyard. Where will Jesus stand? And there'll be nobody there because everybody will be dead. If we nuke Jerusalem, Haifa, Tel Aviv, and Beersheba, then all the Jews will be dead, all the Christians will be dead, and by the way, all the Palestinians will be dead too, but that's okay, that's collateral damage. You see, Arafat sent a team in 1991 to Saddam to ask him, are you going to nuke Jerusalem? Are you going to nuke Israel? And Saddam said, so what if I do? In every war, you have collateral damage. See, the question is this. Is, is, is Islam a religion or is Islam a psychosis? So this is why I shared the five deceptions of Islam, because Islam's bottom line is not a Palestinian state. Islam's bottom line is to kill all the Jews and Christians. And if they have to kill their own Muslims, that's okay. That's the way they feel. The Islamic viewpoint of improving the, the earth is by killing the Jews. Which again, I say, this is a satanic psychosis. So Iran is preparing with nuclear weapons within 10 months. Saudi Arabia already has the weapons. And if you look at the map, I mean, if you know the geography and you look where Israel is and just to the Right, it says Jordan. Actually, Jordan appears on the map of Jordan. And then you see that little Gulf of Eilat, Gulf of Aqaba there. And right in that little corner, you see Saudi Arabia almost reaches the border with Eilat, with Israel. And not far from there, there is an Air Force base by the name of Tabuk, T-A-B-U-K, or T-A-B-U-Q. Tabuk um, is the northwesternmost uh, air base the Saudis have. And they have moved up... <coughs> 
all their F-15s and F-16s and all their helicopters. Uh, they're only 100 miles from Eilat. Now, in 1990, 1991, the Saudis did the same thing, and the Israeli Air Force bombed the runways with sacks of, of flour, white flour, to show the Saudis what the Israelis were capable of doing. The Saudis immediately pulled out all the offensive aircraft. Now the Saudis have reinstated their offensive aircraft in Tabuk, including hundreds of helicopters. The helicopters are capable, they're Chinooks. They can carry 50 commandos, tanks, half-tracks, jeeps, and land just north of Eilat, behind Israeli lines, and cut off Eilat. In other words, if you have 500 helicopters and you can put 50 commandos in each helicopter, that's 25,000 advanced commandos of the Saudi or the combined Arab armies. Cut off Eilat from the north of Israel. The Egyptians, I want to talk about the Egyptians, they have built tunnels under the Suez Canal, and the moment they decide they can go right under the canal, and within six hours, all their military vehicles are on the border with Israel and the Negev, and they too uh, can come right across. It's going to be very hard to stop the Egyptian army. I've been in Sinai. I served for about 10 years in artillery in the Sinai. I know the distances. Six hours, they are at the Israeli border, and there's nothing to stop them if they decide to go into Israel and link up with the Saudis. I participated, I shouldn't be saying this, but I participated in war games in 1996 at Israeli Army General Staff level, and we played out a number of scenarios, and the, according to one of the scenarios, the Syrians and the Hezbollah uh, invade the northern panhandle of Israel, and they occupy it. It takes three days to get rid of them. On the third day of the war, there are reports of increased vehicular activity around our nuclear stockpiles, if you get the message. And as Army spokesmen, we are not supposed to comment on what are we going to, why is there this increased vehicular activity at Israel's nuclear stockpiles? So the Egyptians come in from the southwest, the Saudis from the southeast, Syria, Lebanon from the north, Iran launches missiles, Syria launches missiles, Hezbollah and Lebanon launch missiles, Libya launches missiles, Egypt launches missiles, Saudi Arabia launches missiles, and the Jordanians have no choice but to attack us too, across the Jordan, which means this is the end of Jordan. And when you have hundreds and hundreds of missiles flying in at Israel, some are, are likely to get through it. The question is, will they be tipped with atomic, biological, or, a, or chemical weapons, ABC weaponries? And what I'm predicting, what I'm predicting, because this is the only logical conclusion to all the weapons purchases of these Arab countries, is that these weapons were purchased with one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to attack and destroy Israel, because that's what the Islamic religion teaches. If Israel is destroyed, the Bible is a pack of lies. If Israel is destroyed, Allah is the greater God, greater than the God of the Jews and the Christians. And you know what this is like? Do you remember the prophet Elijah on Mount Carmel with the 400 priests of Baal? God is going to make a decision. And you know, Pharaoh wanted to kill the firstborn of the Israelites. Whose firstborn were killed? Pharaoh's. We don't rejoice about it. But if you want to pluck out the apple of God's eye, Israel, God's going to pluck out both your eyes. Pharaoh wanted to drown the Israelites in the Red Sea. Who got drowned in the Red Sea? The charioteers. And now Pharaoh wants to destroy Israel again. It's a spirit. It's an evil spirit. It is a satanic spirit. But it's not only that, because the Muslims want to kill the Christians and the Hindus and the Buddhists too. How much are the Jews, the Christians, the Hindus, the Buddhists? Five, six of the human race. Now, anybody who thinks that one billion can kill five billion and the world is going to survive or that they can get away with it is completely nuts, completely psychotic. That's why I say Islam is a psychosis. I have to repeat this again and again and again. And if Sean Hannity, if Hannity and Combs have me on their show or the O'Reilly Factor or Greta Van Susteren, I'm going to say, Islam is not a religion. It is a psychosis. And let them sue me. And if they don't sue me, I'll sue them. <laughs> and the Saudis in their article said that Avi Lipkin has launched the most vicious attack on Islam ever. Ever. And I'm very proud of that. And I'm predicting that when these, these 
crazy Islamic leaderships think that they're going to attack Israel and destroy Israel, Israel will be shielded by God. And you know, in Ezekiel 38, 39, it says that God will personally destroy five, six of those who march against Jerusalem. You know why? Because all human beings are created in the image of God. So if the Muslims want to kill five, six of the human race, God is going to destroy five, six of those who want to destroy five, six of the human race. Because anybody who wants to destroy the apple of God's eye will get both his eyes plucked out. And then the one six that remains must convert to Christianity. I would say convert them to Judaism, but my rabbis don't want Muslims to be converted to Judaism. <laughs> I don't want to get into it. It's a very crazy situation. We don't want Muslims to be Jews, we don't want Christians to be Jews, and we don't want Jews to be Jews. <laughs> if I had another three hours, I would explain that one. <laughs> so, bring them to the Lord, or they'll bring you to the sword. So that's the situation. And what I think is going to happen is that eventually Israel will have to defend itself. Um, I don't think that we can even wait for them to attack us. And we're going to have to take care of all these missile silos. So if they attack us first or if we attack them first, the point is all these weapons of mass destruction have to be destroyed. What does it say in Ezekiel 38, 39? That it's going to take seven years to burn all the weaponries that are left strewn on the battlefield. Seven years. Now, did this ever happen yet in the Bible? No. And the kind of weaponries that the Muslims have bought are only for one purpose, to destroy Israel. They don't need these weaponries. But Allah has made them spend all their wealth and all the blessings that God gave them with the oil on weapons of mass destruction. And of course, like I said before, if, they don't, if they're not killing the non-Muslim, they're killing each other. Remember Second Chronicles, where all these armies mass against Jerusalem and then they end up killing each other? And you can expect that to happen too. Isaiah 17, verse 1, where Damascus is destroyed. By the way, I pray to God, Damascus is never destroyed. I don't want to see any Muslims killed. I don't want to see Damascus destroyed. That's a prophecy that has not yet happened. I hope it doesn't happen. But if God says it's going to happen, then it's probably going to happen. In Zechariah 14, it describes that those people marching against Jerusalem will be standing on their feet when all of a sudden their eyes, eyeballs will go into the sockets, their tongues will cleave to their palates, and their skin will fall off of them while they are still standing. Now, what does that seem to be for you? This is an atomic weapons. And Chuck Missler, I hope you'll forgive me for saying my mentor and my teacher, has been talking for a long time that the next major war in the Middle East will be a nuclear war. Why? Because that's what the Muslims are looking for. They want to erase Israel off the face of the earth because that is what their religion teaches them. And, you know, with all due respect to Colin Powell, he says the war in the Middle East is about economics. It's the haves and the have-nots. And I'm saying this is the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. The war in the Middle East with Israel, and even in Iraq, has nothing to do with oil, has nothing to do with economics, has nothing to do with Jerusalem, has nothing to do with settlements, has nothing to do with the Palestinian state. The war in the Middle East is a war between God and Satan, period. This is a war which demands the destruction of the Jews and the Christians and even the Palestinian Muslims by their own fellow Muslims, because that's how crazy Islam is. Now, in the Islamic religion, the Islamic religion is based on a number of principles, which I won't get into tonight. I will only talk about one principle. It's the principle of the Hajj. Hajj is the pilgrimage to Mecca. As part of the Hajj, they go to their holiest site, which is the black stone, the Kaaba. And the Muslims are supposed to circle around the Kaaba, I think, seven times. And there are a few other things they have to do also. And it's all there in that city of Mecca. Now, if they try to nuke Jerusalem, and Jerusalem, praise God, is shielded by God, I think Israel at some stage will have to nuke Mecca. Now, I'm not, you know, contrary to what the Saudis say, I'm not Mossad, I'm not Israeli military, I am not with the government, and I'm actually very disassociated from the Israeli government. I have no contact with anyone in the Israeli government, and I am totally speaking from what I feel God is putting in my mouth to say. The way to bring peace to the earth is to terminate Islam as a religion. The way to terminate Islam as a religion is not to kill a billion, three hundred million Muslims. The way to, to terminate Islam as a religion is to destroy the Black Stone. And there are not many people there at any given moment around the Black Stone, except for the time of the pilgrimage, which is a few weeks out of the year.
Destroy the black stone and you have destroyed Islam. Islam cannot exist without the black stone. At the moment you destroy the black stone, it is like cutting off the head of the snake. Now, when you cut off the head of the snake, the, the snake is officially terminated, but the snake continues to writhe and coil, and it's still dangerous. When Mecca will be destroyed, or when Damascus will be destroyed, that's when the orders will be given in Mecca and throughout the Islamic world to murder the Jews. Now you understand why I told you the Canadian testimony, because everything is now in place for them. All they need is the orders. The orders will happen when there is a major war in the Middle East. When will there be a major war in the Middle East? I'm very afraid it'll be within 10 months to a year. And of course, I don't want you to be angry with me if I come back in a year from now and it hasn't happened yet. And I praise God when I'm wrong. By the way, the prophet Jonah was told by God to go east three days to Nineveh and tell the people of Nineveh that their city was going to be destroyed. Now, Jonah was an egotistical person. And Jonah knew that if he, the Jew, would go to the non-Jewish Gentile city of Nineveh and say, in 40 days, you guys are toast, he might be toast. So he didn't want to be toast. So he went west, took a boat, you know, away from Israel, and you know, all know he had a whale of a time. <laughs> and, and, and Jonah repents, and finally he goes to Nineveh. You know, the book of Jonah is a very funny book. Even the animals put on sackcloth and ash and fasted and prayed. Have you ever seen animals putting on sackcloth, ashes, and praying? I mean, whoever wrote that must have been like a Mel Brooks or something. <laughs> and the people of Nineveh repented, and God relented. So, you know, I'm telling you what I see here as, uh, as uh, the statistics and the information that I have. But God has a sense of humor, and God is constantly reshuffling the deck. Praise God. And like I said before, I pray to God that no Muslim will be killed and that these wars will not happen and Damascus will not be destroyed, but that black rock in Mecca has to go. And by the way, you know, these Muslims have been breaking every international law in the book regarding archaeology with the burrowing underneath the Temple Mount. And you know what's going to happen? They've burrowed and burrowed and burrowed. They have weakened the foundations of all the, all, everything that those mosques are standing on now. God is going to have a hiccup. And those mosques are going to slide right into the Kidron Valley. How many people have seen the, the, the part of the wall that collapsed on top of the Temple Mount? It's not the Western Wall. It is the wall of the Islamic Museum next to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. I've seen it with my own eyes, but I have it on email. Anybody who wants, take my card, send me a little email. I will mail to you, forward to you, the pictures of the wall collapsing just above the Western Wall. The Muslims have weakened the foundations and God is going to, I believe, not the Jews, this is going to be an act of God that those two mosques, which are houses of abomination, will be cleaned away from the holiest spot of the Jews and the Christians. And by the way, today the Jews and the Christians are allowed once a month to go up on the Temple Mount. Just don't pray, just visit. Because if you put your hands in the air and start praying or something, immediately you're going to be arrested. But when you get arrested by the Israeli police, they say, were you praying? And then you're going to say yes. And then they're going to say, what were you praying? We were praying for God to bless Israel. And then they'll kick you out of the old police office and send you <laughs> back to the hotel where you were. So anyway, so I'm predicting that there will be a war. I'm predicting also, by the way, I don't want to get into it too much. In my first book, I talk about this. Oklahoma City was an Islamic attack. McVeigh and Nichols were not right-wing Christian militia. This is one of Bill Clinton's biggest lies after Monica Lewinsky. Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols were prototypes of the Johnny Walker Lind, the, Marine, the, the Taliban of Marine County, California. And Terry Nichols trained in the Philippines with, with whom? With Ramzi Yusuf, the guy who built the bomb in New York in 1993. By the way, TW800, how many people believe that this came down by itself? Yeah. <laughs> you don't believe your media? You don't believe Bill Clinton? Anyway, so do you know that the day that TWA was shot out of the skies, was Iraq's Independence Day. And Saddam Hussein said the day before, tomorrow's Iraq's Independence Day, we're going to give the world a big surprise. So anyway, that's in my third book. In my first book, I was in Tulsa when the bomb went off in Oklahoma City. The bomb makings were sold to three Middle Eastern men. How many people remember that day of the bombing, three Middle Eastern men? They were there. Bill Clinton decided to cover it up. Get the video, Arlington Road. How many people saw Arlington Road? 
Arlington Road, get the video. I won't say anything about it. Just get it. It shows how the media, I said I won't say anything about it. I'm saying it. Sorry. <laughs> it shows you how the media can focus everything on one person and, and not talk at all about what was surrounding that person. Um, I also get the Peacemaker. Peacemaker is a very important video you need to see. Um, so anyway, so I've spoken about, how much time do I have left? Okay, I have uh, th now the third testimony, and this is where I think we're really going. I, I mean, we're in for, for a roller coaster ride here. I wanted to share with you a New Testament teaching. Is that okay for a Jew to teach a New Testament teaching? You know the curse on the fig tree because it didn't have the first fruits? And this, by the way, is a, for me, is a very recent teaching I just learned, but it fits perfectly with what I wanted to share. If there are no first fruits, then it's very, very hard to predict the latter fruits. But when you have first fruits, it's, very, it's a lot easier to predict the latter fruits. Now, I used to hate the Christians. And if you had asked me, even five years ago, or 10 years ago, do I want to see Christians in the land of Israel? I would have said no. Not because I hated Christians, which I did, but because Israel is the land of the Jews. We have one Jewish state, and it's the land of Israel. Christians have all these other countries. Muslims have all these other countries. Jews have only one country, so let it be Israel. Okay? And one of the things I've learned is that I am, we say in Hebrew, Ephes, which is zero, and in Yiddish, Gurnicht, or in German, Garnicht, I'm nothing without God. In other words, it doesn't matter what I want or what I think. What matters is what God wants. What we're trying to do here in Koinonia House or, or people like myself is to try to understand what does God want? What does God want from us? It's like my wife. I never know what she wants from me. <laughs> and she gets angry. Why don't I know what she wants? I have to read her mind, you know? I feel like Jackie Mason sometimes. Anyway, so God has given us a teaching. The question is, does God want the Christians in the Holy Land? And I think the answer is yes. And I will prove this now. Ten years ago, 15 years ago, or more correctly, 15 years ago, when you said Christian in the Holy Land, you meant either tourists or Arab Christians from the Galilee or from Haifa or Akko or from Jerusalem because the Arab Christians were 2% of the population. And they are today also 2% of the population. But God did something. Do you remember the fall of the Soviet Union? God brought home 1 million people. I don't say he brought home 1 million Jews. He brought home 1 million people. 30% of the people are not Jews. 30% of the people of the 1 million, 300,000, are either Russian Orthodox, Ukrainian Catholic, or Protestants from the Baltic states who are intermarried with the Jews or they are children of mixed marriages. If you can seem to remember what I was talking about an hour ago. Did I want these Christians? No, but if the Jews are coming home, the Christians are coming home. So today, instead of a 2% population, we have a 7% Christian population. And 5% of the population, which is Jewish, is intermarried with these Christians. Now, you know in the Bible it says those who bless Israel are blessed? And those who curse Israel are cursed. Now, these Christians bless Israel because they are married with Jews. They serve in the army. They serve in the Israeli army. They get their guts blown out by the Islamic homicide bombers. These Christians work, pay taxes, and vote. They are Israelis. They're Christians, but they're Israelis. By the way, in the army, they swear on the New Testament when they join the Israeli army. 12% of the population today is Judeo-Christian, meaning 2% Arab Christian, 5% Russian, Ukrainian, Ethiopian Christian, and 5% Russian, Ukrainian, and Ethiopian Jews. Translated politically, if there were today a political party of Jews and Christians, we would have 14 members of Knesset. And yet there are no Christians today in our Knesset. The Christians alone would, de would deserve according to their numbers, to have a they have a constituency of 7%, that's eight members of Knesset. So, what I feel God is saying to me, he's saying to me, son, if you don't want to do it, I'll find someone else. And I feel I'm, I feel I'm saying to God, listen, I want to do what you want me to do. Okay, now sometimes we don't understand exactly what God wants us to do. God shows us day by day what his marching plans are. But my feeling is, that if you've got 
12 members of Knesset today out of 120 who are Muslims, they don't serve in the army, they hate us, they want to destroy the Jewish state, but by law they have a right to be in the Knesset because they represent an Islamic constituency. So now if God has created a new population, a new nation that we knew not before, look at Psalm 102, it talks about a new nation that we did not know before. That's Psalm 102. It's in other places too. And if I really believe in the teachings of love, love the Lord thy God, love thy fellows thyself, and these people are coming to Israel to love us and to be with us, these Christians, they're coming to bless us. And if they're coming to bless us, they will be blessed. Those Christians who hate Israel, you know, in other words, certain Arab Christians who are Catholic or, I'm not saying all Catholics, some Catholic Arab Christians are loving Israel. Some Eastern Orthodox Christians love Israel, but many of them are in bed with the Muslims because they speak Arabic, it's their culture, and they hate the Jews to prove to the Muslims that they are loyal to the Islamic cause, to the Arab cause, the Palestinian cause. So these curse the Jews, so they're cursed. What do the Muslims do to these Christians who curse us? They curse them. Bethlehem, in the last 15 years, has turned from being 90% Christian to 90% Muslim. Why? The Muslims chased them out. Those who curse Israel will be cursed. Nazareth is 70% Muslim today. So Bethlehem is 90% Muslim. That's in my first book. In my second book, Nazareth is 70% Muslim. And you have in every mixed Christian Muslim community of Arabs, they're fighting each other. And in the end, the Christians flee because the Muslims are going to chop off their arms and legs and kill them. Christians are not capable of doing this, but the Muslims are. The Russian, Ukrainian, and Ethiopian Christians are very different. They love the Jews, they are intermarried with the Jews, and they are part of the nuclear family. So they bless Israel. Those who bless Israel will be blessed. Now, I'm going to say something very, very radical. Of course, I didn't say anything radical today. <laughs> Do you believe in Romans 9 to 11 that you as Christians are grafted into the Jews? What, what it means, basically, is that we're the roots, you're the branches. We are now part of the same tree, okay? Now, if we are part of the same tree, what's the name of the tree? Israel. You're part of Israel. If we Jews bless you, we will be blessed. If we curse you, we will be cursed. If we love you, we will be loved. If we hate you, we will be hated. Now you begin to understand why I believe God wants a Judeo-Christian political party in Israel. It will be a love party where Jews love Christians and Christians love Jews. You want to be a hater? God forbid you can become a Muslim. <laughs> you want to be in this party? You got to be a lover. Jews and Christians have to get over this 2,000 years of hatred. And what I think is going to happen, like I said before, is that there's going to be a war. Now I said, 10 months, uh, Chuck Missler said 18 months. Uh, it could be in three or four years from now. It could be in 10 years from now. We don't know the time of the coming of the Lord, and we definitely do not know the time of wars. We see a writing on the wall, but we do not have the time. Now, I personally believe that if the elections are scheduled for 2007 in Israel, I'm praying to God that by 2005 I will be in a position to create this political party. And I'm going to have to wrap up. I'm going to have three minutes to wrap up. Then we'll take a break, I think, again, and go for the, maybe some questions and answers. Or... Uh, I don't know. Take your three minutes. And okay, well, I'm going to roll with this. I think that after the next war, and then all of a sudden you have all these Jews fleeing for murders, Muslims killing them, and the Jews are intermarried with the Christians, and they're going to be children from the intermarriages. The first fruits are what we saw coming from the former Soviet Union. The latter fruits are the Jews and the Christians who are married to each other or Christians who love Israel who will be coming home. Five, 10, 15 million, I believe, will come home to Israel, and Israel will go from the Nile to the Euphrates. Not because we Jews are fascists or conquerors or occupiers. It's because the Muslims gave us no choice, and that was what God wanted, not what we wanted. It was God's word. And, you know, I want to conclude, because we have, like, now down to two minutes. I'm going to tell a joke which is confirmed in the Gospel of John. It's a Jewish joke. The joke is that the Messiah was reported on the Mount of Olives by the Mossad leader to the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister says, give me five minutes. I'll give you what, an answer what to do with this Messiah. You know, what is the Orthodox Party going to say about it? 
And they call up Ben Gurion Airport, you know, the girls who stamp your passports when you get off the plane, and they say to the commander of these ladies, go up to the Mount of Olives and approach the Messiah very humbly, very respectfully, and very meekly, and ask him, excuse me, sir, is this your first visit to the Holy Land? <laughs> the confirmation in the Gospel of John is after the crucifixion and the resurrection, Jesus is walking around the Galilee for 40 days, and Mary doesn't recognize him, and the disciples don't recognize him. What does Jesus say? Look at my hands. And what I want to suggest to all of us is that we stay alive and that we meet in Jerusalem on that day. And don't give the Muslims the victory to kill all of us. That is what I want. And then we will all go up to the Messiah on that day and say, can we look at your hands, please? <laughs> and that will be fine enough for me. And I welcome you all to Israel. Please come to Israel. Please stand with us. Don't leave us with our hotels empty and with our tourist guides without jobs and our stores suffering. If you love Jesus and if you love God, stand with Israel in our time of need. Thank you very much.